Defining Duke is sponsored by the Remarkable Glassware at Freeze Pipe. I'm telling you, my Freeze Pipe products had me completely abandon my old favorite companies and with good reason. Freeze Pipe is superior, period. American owned and with over 100,000 happy customers, Freeze Pipe is your solution to smoke like royalty without paying a king's ransom. Shop now at thefreezepipe.com. That's T-H-E-F-R-E-E-Z-E-P-I-P-E.com. And use the code Duke, that's D-U-K-E, for 10% off your entire order. That's thefreezepipe.com with the checkout code Duke for 10% off. Order today to get free shipping and say goodbye to harsh smoke forever at thefreezepipe.com with the checkout code Duke. Defining Duke, an Xbox podcast is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support the show, go to patreon.com slash Media. Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today, and welcome to episode 168 of Defining Duke, an Xbox podcast. Today, I'm joined by the man who's got many tech insurance. This time, it's martial law, Lord Cognito. How are you today, sir? Busy week, I imagine. Woo! Man, I'm moving at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> 100 miles an hour, trying to sneak in games when I can, but the reality is, it's just one of those weeks you just got to throw your hands up and say, it's like, it's too much going on. Yeah, you got to yeah. be a normal person now. Got, got to be normal. <laughs> got to be one of the mortals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, but, I, you know, most people don't prepping uh, for PAX East, and my travel there, and then obviously we got Sacred Symbols 300, Live mm-hmm. Show, IOP, so it's a lot going on at once, and just trying to get everything scheduled, and then, you know, game-wise, and meeting with devs and scheduling and appointments and yeah, it, packed, it never man. stops brother it never you know you know the pack scratch so you understand yeah. that part so yeah it's just been you know just trying to keep my head above water and, and delegate as much as i can so i don't go too crazy mm. and then yeah get on that get on that train and that, that a seller i like the seller shout out to the seller it's a yes, nice sir. little train get a little bougie sit back yeah you know, enjoy you yourself to- I think yeah. it's important to do that ahead of such a, a busy time for you, right? Sacred 300, you're all over the show floor on PAX East. Like, I roam and kind of just go with what catches my interest now. You know, if I see a couple of heavy hitters, I'll set up appointments. But otherwise, I haven't set up appointments these last two PAXs. But, like, you, on the other hand, are crawling all over that show floor. So, first off, everyone put some respect to my man's game here. But number two is, like, you got to unwind before you dive into that, right? If you're going sprinting in the PAX, like, you're just not going to be as sharp, not on your A game. And, you do a ton of interviews, so I think yeah. you're doing the right thing. It's smart. Thank you. Much appreciated. How have you been? What's been going on with Mr. Maddie Plays? Doing pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was in Wilmington, North Carolina this Ooh, past week. I see. I have friends there. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, dude. What a what an amazing location. Like really? a, a real nugget in the United States. You know, I, I I loved everything about North Carolina. Um, we flew in Ooh. Thursday, we're there till Sunday. Uh, my first set of flights since all my swaying and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the important part. Let's yeah. get to it. Wait, 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 how'd that go? <laughs> I forgot all about that part. I was yeah. like, yeah, he survived the flight. Let's go. Yeah, no, it's uh, it was it was honestly great. Well, I'll put it this way, right? The first flight out there, Delta, and that was a bit nerve wracking because I was like, okay, like reality hit me, bro. It was like it was that MRI type fear. It was like, all right, here we go. Like this is it. You know, like <laughs> the takeoff. Everything felt a little hit a little different because it was a mixture of like I forgot what being on a plane feels like. It's been half a decade it has like just with covid and everything mixed in like i haven't been on a plane since 2019 i was like so it hit me also this is it's gonna be a mixture of like my health but also you know just the feeling out of plane again and uh yeah there was only one moment it was like a whoa that felt weird and that's when sometimes the the free fall the the, sometimes the dude just lets go of something in the in the cockpit you just feel the plane falling for a moment and then they pick back up that happened once. That was the only weird thing going out there. Going home, I flew on Spirit for the first time. <laughs> I heard some horror stories. I got to say, I picked a hell of a week, right? With everything happening with Boeing, I picked a hell of a week to, you know, yeah. just yeah, let me let me fly Spirit, right? Uh, but it was the only flight home that Ooh. wasn't ridiculously early. And we gotcha. had to drive a couple hours to get to the airport from North Carolina where we were because we didn't fly into Wilmington. So, mm-hmm. We take spirit for the first time. Honestly, great staff. Plane mm. was incredible. Like every roomy. It was it was great. It was great. I will also say only one thing. Mm-hmm. Whoever this pilot was, if you could define whipping it in a plane, 
this man figured it out. Like we were 45 degrees, like, and then going the other way. I was like, I actually thought at one point we were going down. I haven't flown into <laughs> LaGuardia in a while. I was I was thinking of Todd Howard as I was watching the water closely approach the plane because I forgot LaGuardia is like the port is right on the water. So I'm just looking out the window. I'm like, damn, we're getting lower and lower. <laughs> and all I see is water. Yo, we're really close to the ground. I only see water right now. And all of a sudden the airstrip ca- crawls in like, okay. <laughs> I was like panicking on the inside for Yo. those breathing techniques were not saving me. I was oh, just geez. like, "Yo, this is it. My this first it. plane trip in five years, and this is how it goes." <laughs> I feel you. you. Always feel like the bad thing gonna happen to you when you experience yeah, it, right? Yeah. Like, of course, hundred percent, hundred percent. But yeah, it, in all seriousness, it was uh, you know, the the after effects of the flight, if you will, great. You know, no additional swaying, no problems. In fact, I've felt better since my flights. I don't know if it's, I've, I've heard sometimes it's like a mentality thing with chronic swaying and whatnot. Like you build some travel confidence is what it's called. And so mm-hmm. I really felt good. Like I, and, and compared that four day vacation to, to what I had three weeks off at the end of December. Granted, that's like after grind time. Like we do a ton of shows in advance. Like I'm going to be more tired then. But dude, I, I've felt like a million bucks walking out nice. of North Carolina. Felt really refreshed. Felt really good. And uh, it, it was kudos to my fiance. She's been saying uh, for a while, she's like, take more breaks. Like, just you don't got to go crazy. Just like three, four days. Go on a little trip. Watch what happens. And I'm like, no, but once I'm done working, I'm tired. Like, I don't want to get on a plane. I was like, nope. My mentality has shifted. Like, nice. I, I, I got the travel bug. I was like, get me nice. on a plane. Like, I want to unpack or uh, un, un disconnect, unwind. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it was it was phenomenal. The food there was great. Nice. Uh, the retro game hall. Hold on. Oh, let's go. Let's get to the game. Hold on. I got a big got, stuff here. Oh, oh, you got the stash. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Cast like all, uh, let's see okay. here. I'm doing a video on it. Uh, but we got Sonic Adventure for the Dreamcast. Kingdom Hearts. Nice. I made over two days. Mm. Star Wars Jedi 2 Jedi Outcast. Nightcaster 1 and 2 for my OG Xbox fans out there. Uh, those were exclusives. Ratchet and Clank Size Matters. A nice. lot of Vita games. Yeah, it was, oh, the pickings were incredible. Actually, uh, a gentleman inside uh, one of the stores I went to, Game Giant, mm-hmm. had uh, recognized me from Retro Rebound, what? which is cool. He's like, is that Mr. Matty Play? Is that No, him? I don't hear, is that Mr. Matty Play? I, don't, I have not been recognized from Mr. Matty in a while. Stop. I what did they do? What they hit you with? What they hit you with? When they saw do you, you do, like what's been hit with me these last few times is like you know, hey, do you do uh, like videos on YouTube? I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I don't keep it like a secret. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, and they're like, like retro rebound, right? I'm like, oh. yeah, and I'm like, so it's it's awesome. I mean, that's that's that was the goal was to branch out to a new audience, but that it's funny like that channel. Is, uh, oh, look at that! Yeah, okay, yeah, with the Mega Drive okay. joint, okay. And the Genesis joint with the booklet and all okay. that. Yeah, yeah, there we so, go. yeah. yeah. So, so you get known, you get known for this goodness right here. But yeah, <laughs> I, I love this type of stuff. So yeah, the fact it, it would make sense because in that field they would be enthusiasts and find a channel like you. That's dope. Yeah, oh, that's yeah dope. it's it's cool. It's cool. It makes me really happy. It's very validating, of course, and, and everyone I've met through that channel. I mean, the, the audience on Retro Rebound is like the sweetest audience I have ever encountered. It literally gave me hope in my career where I was like, I don't know how I'm feeling about all this, man. Just this toxicity is just getting to me. But the, the, the people there are incredible. And everyone I've met through Retro Rebound has just been wonderful. So yeah, it's it was a fantastic trip. We had a really good time out there. And so, yeah, we will, we will be going back to North Carolina. No doubt about it. I shot the NC. Now, while Cog's 478 breathing technique didn't necessarily help me in my, my near crash landing, Samuel Peterson does have a great write in here on how it did help Cog. Greetings, Dukes. Just wanted to give Cog a shout out for his breathing tip last week. My 12 year old son was having a mini panic attack and it helped calm them down. Thanks again. Have a wonderful trip, Cog. Oh, thanks. That's love. That's love, man. Yeah, man. I, I'm glad it, it helped anyone. And and at the end of the day, you know, a lot of the uh, the Dukes, the the the, uh, the Ramana the Dukes and the yoga community actually uh, commented as well. They were like, what you know about that? You know what I'm so I was it's like, yoga right. community? That's a thing? All right. Yeah. The, the, apparently, that. there's a, the LSM yoga community. They they pulled okay. up. They was like, Cog, we know about that. I, I saw some comments on the YouTube channel in reference to I was I like, I didn't wow. see that, yeah. Yeah, that was super dope. So yeah, salute to that. It really helped me and whatever we could do to help each other get through a panic. Panic attacks are real. Like I never used to have them until I got older. And it's like, yeah, now I'm like, yo, this is a thing in our community. And it really, whatever we could do to mitigate that. So salute. 
to Sam. Yeah, it probably too. probably stems from like when you're younger, you feel invincible, and when you get older, you know, you got something to protect or something like worth losing, and and so when you feel that threat, it hits you yes. really hard. The, yeah, um, the reality of your mortality is what yes. I call it. You're like, yo, yeah. if I don't do certain things, I could go. And when mm-hmm. you're young, you're just like, eh, like not, 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 yeah. you've never experienced any type of life and death. Right. You know what I'm saying? Type of situation. So you have yeah. that, pl- that you know, blissful ignorance. 100%. Yeah. So shout out to Samuel. Appreciate you listening. And uh, Cog, shout out to you for sharing the, the true health is wealth mantra. Just remember, area code 478. That's how you remember the breathing 478. Technique. There we go. <laughs> Sean Mason. Yeah, it's funny, Cog. You're enriching our audience. I may be dragging them down to a level not many want to sink to, but Sean Mason is game for this. He writes, greetings, Dukes. Matty, your enthusiasm for the DBS card game finally persuaded me. Over the years, I've heard you talk about it with such passion. So now that there is a digital client, I finally decided to give it a shot. Being a dr- dedicated Dragon Ball fan, I felt it was only fair to Toriyama to explore it. Well, after spending $100 on cards, I must admit I'm completely hooked. I've never been so drawn to a card game like this before, but now I can't get it out of my head. Thanks for convincing me to dive in. Best Sean M. Sean, dude. That's where all that teacher money's got to go, man. You got to support the packs. You got to rip some packs. I'm telling y'all, like, I know card games are, are a dime a dozen out there. You know, we've been playing Final Fantasy Rebirth and and you got Queen's Blood, but there is no better card game than Dragon Ball Super Card Game Fusion World. I'm not kidding. It is so good, so interactive. It's one of those just like one match a night thing. Like, I, I played it last night before I got off and went to bed. I was like, yeah, it's a little match here. You don't got to spend a hundred bucks like Sean. Maybe you do, but I, I, you know, I'm not going to stop you. But shout out to Sean Mason for listening, for for taking us up on our offer here with Dragon Ball Super Card Game. If more of you try it out, let me know what you think. Please write in. All right, Cog. It's time to get into some of the little bits of news. First one here. Bungie has replaced the director for Marathon amid more shakeups, more fear of layoffs. Cog, walk me through this. This is your company. This is your team. How are we feeling about things, the direction we're going in? Fill us in. Yeah, man, this is fresh off the press. Again, shout out to, I guess, Rebecca Valentine who did the reporting. Generally, her sourcing is, is pretty solid. So it looks like, yeah, they've, they've replaced the uh, designer, which was Christopher Barrett. And Christopher Barrett, is he's been there for a while with Bungie. Christopher Barrett also, and the team that they assembled was also part of the main PvP team with Destiny. So a lot mm-hmm. of people were frustrated when they saw the, the marathon announcement because they're like, Oh, this is why you can't give us any, you know, dedicated PVP maps and and stuff at that time. Obviously, they're fixing it now. But at the time, people were like, yo, where is the PVP community? The, 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 basically, they have this thing called the This Week at Bungie, right? And they give you the periodic mm-hmm. updates. So we wouldn't see these guys for so long. So now that he's gone, and I believe they got a Valorant uh, gentleman by the name of Z- Zeigler, Joe Zeigler, and he, he left Riot Games for Bungie. So he's handling the project. So it will say this. It. Right now, it's a, it's a tumultuous time. You know, there's there's a lot of reset or reports going around stating that, hey, you know, pre-orders are down for Final Shape. If it doesn't hit, you know, the dreaded um, takeover as far as as far as the board, because the way uh, Bungie had their deal set up, you know, they had enough placeholders in control of the board that they would ultimately have the you know, the majority decision, so to speak. But if they continue to not miss targets, they make their targets, then Sony can kind of come in. And I think that's the fear. So it, it's it's a weird time because there's a part of me that's like, look, they overshot. They made a lot of unrealistic expectations with life hole expansion. They didn't hit. It was a failure, right? And that's on them, right? That is part of their leadership. But then there's another part of me that's like, and again, it's like if Sony takes over, Sony may be able to course correct them on overspending and, and getting the budgets in line. My concern is that from a multiplayer live service standpoint, their leadership doesn't have much experience in that space either. And if they're ultimately the ones in control, what the article kind of brings out is that, you know, there is a a thought process that, you know, other leadership would leave before that happens. Mm. So it says, yeah, within the company, there's a growing expectation, as Rebecca reported, that senior company leadership will leave in droves in the summer of 2026 when the final payouts from Sony's acquisition of the company take effect. With this Mm. in mind, there's a strong push to get Marathon, which is the, the, the 
PvP tactical shooter. And apparently that's changed direction now with Ziegler. Now it's kind of more hero based. So oh we got to see how that's going to oh go. Boy. Like, yeah, now we getting into this uh, like war. I, uh, you know, and I, I, I don't, I don't want to be disrespectful because let's just say it's the right play and it's more fun. I don't know. But when you change direction like that, there's always concern in the building of, yeah. about what the final product will be. So, yeah, that, that's what it is. It's a it's an unsettling time. You know, when I get into what I play and I'll talk about more about, you know, the game of Destiny, what's going on. But as far as a um, marathon, this is a critical IP for them. Critical because they need this to hit in addition to hitting these targets. They need this to be a success. This is their first new IP in a while. So, yeah, yeah weird, weird, weird times right now. Yeah, we got a write in here, Cog. Originally, it was in our what we're playing section, but I feel like with what you're talking about, it's a good time to pull it up now. Sure. Uh, Rezu RD writes in, Hola, Dukes. I'll be simple and clean. I have to clap back at Cog. Pause. Last week, under the what we're playing section, he mentioned during his Destiny 2 comeback that he is scared of a Sony complete takeover. And part of me understands. But we've seen many people in situations where we know that the current leadership has to go. Why are people just scared to see the bad apples go? Have a rip my wallet with all these games kind of day. Thank you for writing in, Rezo. Cog, any added thoughts on this? Yeah, that's, no, it's a good question. And, you know, people say, hey, why? You know, he says, you know, why would they you want the leadership to go? And look, I will give Rezu this from a upper management standpoint. Yes, the decisions were not good that led them into the, where they are, right? Mm-hmm. However, the reason why I'm scared is because the developers were telling them that this is what came out in the reporting. Hey, you got to cr- cross correct. The community is upset. They're in shambles. They, you need to do X, Y, and Z. They're saying no, no, no. So there's one t- p- uh, form of thinking that's like, yo, just get rid of them. Things will be fine. My concern is there's no guarantee that new leadership is going to listen to the developers yeah. either. Right. And, and then. You're talking about leadership. And again, no disrespect to Sony, but that is not their expertise. They hired Bungie to get that expertise that they were lacking and build out this portfolio of live service games. So, it, it, again, I don't want to fear monger too much, but I do have a concern either way. Right. You know, what I'm saying as far as this is concerned, it's, it's something to monitor, because if they don't hit targets, there will be massive changes. There's no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, there's. A distinct importance of marathon, especially for people like me. Like I, I want to play Destiny and and get into it. I would say one of these days, but who knows with a live service product, like how long it goes for, and if like they do a new thing, and it's better just to start there. Like Destiny Two, I think is one of the least beginner friendly games that you can hop into right now. And I get it; it's been going for so long. It, it has to eventually evolve, and I like that for the hardcore fan base, it's managed to retain so much. But just by nature of how they've like vaulted content and treated story beats. It's tough to get into. So for someone like me, who obviously is like an Xbox fan, has a lot of adoration for Bungie. Marathon is more what I'm looking at is something to give me my Bungie fix. Um, and so I feel like it's it's vital for that alone. It's like you may not be a Destiny fan, but that's not just the only thing this company does like that. When you think about how long they've only done Destiny for, it's pretty crazy, right? Like Marathon symbolizes yeah. finally, hey, you don't if you're not playing destiny like you're not missing out on just what bungie's doing and i say all that because most people even when i sung the praises of my brief time with destiny 2 i was like man it feels good to play a bungie game like it just there's a feel to their their gunplay and their movement that's fantastic and marathon if it could provide that uh, i don't need to go to like the one-stop live service game that's gonna bleed me dry it seems you know in their lesser benevolent days when they're not you know trying to rope us back <laughs> in with hoverboards um, you know, marathon stance is something to, to pull people like me in. So I think it's doubly important that they absolutely nail this one. And so hope I, I think there's a list that's much longer of games that have a change in direction and turn out worse because it's yeah. very hard to, unless you completely restart, it's very hard to rip out that core product and turn into something else. Obviously I can't think off the top of my head right now, but I'm sure there are some examples of that turning out well, or directions have shifted, but uh, yeah, when it comes to this one, I don't know what the actual release timeline was for Marathon, but right. hearing a shift what seems to be relatively late in development yes. um, is it's a tad concerning. Um, yeah, no, again, and, and to your point, you know, what the report brought out, it says moving away from custom uh, player characters in favor of selectable cast of heroes. So there is a part in, 
in fairness, maybe there's a part that if you make these really cool characters, almost like a, I don't say in an Overwatch kind of fashion, but something that has identity that maybe people connect with that as opposed to the custom, I don't know. And then I don't know the tone of the games per se, because I mean, the initial tone seemed a little bit more serious, but with colorful, tactical kind of gameplay does yeah. a cast of heroes. Maybe it's in the Rainbow Six Siege mode. I don't know. There's a lot yeah. of variables here where it could go left. Or it could be fun, but whatever you see is shifted. You do have to raise your eyebrows a little bit just to say, okay, I hope sure. you know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, okay. Kind of so we'll see. We'll see. We shall see. Next up, we have speaking of hero shooters, Overwatch 2. Uh, there are some pretty massive changes hitting season 10 as Blizzard will no longer be locking heroes behind a battle pass in Overwatch 2, starting with that season and also giving players access to previously locked heroes. You still need to go through like that intro phase where you unlock like the original Overwatch heroes. Once you do that, you get all of Overwatch 2's heroes. Uh, they'll also be making Mythic skins available for direct purchase and adding a new game mode in called Clash, among a few other changes with Overwatch 2. So, Cog, hearing all of this, is this roped you back in? Are you interested in firing up Overwatch 2, knowing that everything will be available? They've shifted the monetization for the game. It seems like their old way of doing things was not working mm. out if they're changing it. So what are your thoughts, sir? They seem so resistant for so long. I wonder why the change is now. I wonder <laughs> why. <laughs> you know, very curious on the engagement. Um, I don't know. You know, for whatever reason, this Overwatch didn't connect with me. The first one did. And I just feel whether it be the player count or the fact that they kind of ripped the first one away, you know, and, and now forced the second one was always a little funny to me. I do mm -hmm. like the fact of them unlocking the heroes behind that. Like that, that's fair. Like let people enjoy, you know, these different heroes and then making these uh, monetization kind of fixes, so to speak. But we got to see. I, I, I haven't really been following. Like it, it's something about this old watch. I'll be honest. It was one of my picks. It did review decently, you know what I'm saying, when we did our yeah. little fantasy draft. And I figured it would be stronger, but it just doesn't seem to have that energy the first one had, where I felt like the, everyone in the community was playing everywhere. When I spoke to the hardcore, they were like, uh, damn, you know who's a big Overwatch guy? Jazz, Jazz Gordon. I speak to him. Mm, and he, he just, Blizzard. Yeah, it's just, it's not that it's bad. It's just that, like, people kind of love that first game. It's still the energy. But again, Overwatch community, you guys correct me if I'm wrong. Is it Has it been a resurgence? Is it a Halo Infinite type of situation right now? I'm very curious for the people who are the grinders, the day-to-day. -day. It's like how I'm in Destiny. I'm very curious for the people who are still remaining with the Overwatch. You know, how is it perceived right now? Are they course correcting or it's like, because I know one community that is definitely angry and is completely different in, in terms of fighting is the Mortal Kombat community. They are furious. Oh, I've seen really? people in there. They were like, bro, what y'all doing? Y'all like, let's get I that game fast, so I don't yeah. know what's going on there. There's a lot of stuff there. So I'm curious. I, I would love to get the realm of the Dukes, um, you know, some some seasoned veterans that of Overwatch yeah. 2. Like, what what's going on? What's the, what's tap me into the pulse of what's happening you know <laughs> yeah i agree i um with overwatch 2 i you know it's funny because i put like five or six hundred hours into the first overwatch like i really oh, wow. liked it yeah i played it a lot by the way i played it on ps4 you know like wow. that's not the home platform like wow. i i probably want to put that in on pc but yeah um overwatch 2 was so unnecessary but it was forced into reality because they didn't update the first Overwatch for a while. If I were to wager a guess as to why so many people became disenfranchised with Overwatch, it's because of the way they treated it. Like you were, imagine sitting on the next big thing, right? Not even sitting, it's actively growing. People love it. They're invested in the lore. I remember hanging on to every new trailer, every new character reveal. It was like a routine every night, Overwatch. Mm -hmm. It was like the Tekken bug that we've talked yes. about. Yes. Overwatch was that on an incredible level. It was so much fun. I've actually made some of my best friends to this day. Some people working on the video game I'm working on right now with me, I met through Overwatch. Wow. Like, super important game, right? Wow. Imagine sitting on something like that and you stop fucking updating it. Like all to introduce maps that have time of day changes, a couple new heroes and awful monetization. It was so obvious what it was. And I think a lot of the fan base just lost trust it's like I, that's why i haven't gone back i'm like I, it's fucking blizzard man i don't trust them as far as i can throw them like what are you guys going to do that's going to show me like you're not going to do something dim-witted as that and and just drop support for the game that's thriving by the way like i guarantee if there was like a council of top tier developers they would just be sitting there in their high thrones going 
what are you doing right now? You have a popping live service game and you're not supporting it? Make it make sense. I know that's the past. Overwatch is still a fun game to play, but the balancing, the meta also destroyed it when it was like triple tanks. Like there's just so many other factors that snowballed the descent of that game because they just kept changing it. And yeah. you just can't trust. I mean, look at this. This is another massive change for Overwatch. Positive one, in my opinion, as someone who hasn't played it for a while. Uh, so yeah, they, I, I just, I had a couple of buddies in my group chat. They're like, yo, Overwatch tonight. I was like, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> He's no. like, no, <laughs> shut that down quick. I was like, hell no. They're like, you're whack, man. I'm like, dude, I'm not playing this. Like they got to earn me back and then some, I put my hours in. They I'll got a ton of my money. Like I'm not going back until I know I can trust them to just leave it as it is. Get into this healthy state. I don't care about, and while it is important, I'm saying personally, I'm not, ditching the game like some digs esports community sucks it's like i'm i'm not trying to go pro right so right. yeah that's where i stand on it i'm just not you know i think it's great that they're sticking with it i think it's great that they're updating it this is seemingly a great change for your wallet yes. uh, but for me personally i will watch from the stands and if the uh, seasoned dukes in the overwatch community call me in and say like hey kid it's your time get on the field you know it's like, okay then i'll then I'll go on in and I'll give it a shot. But we'll wait until the word of our season Dukes chimes in. Respectfully. Yep. I'm with you. Defining Duke is sponsored by the Remarkable Glassware at FreezePipe, which you can learn more about right now at thefreezepipe.com. Use the code Duke at checkout for 10% off your order. It's me, Colin, proprietor of Last Stand Media, and an unusual voice to hear on Defining Duke, I admit. But I needed to cross the DMZ to tell you about a remarkable product that's recently walked into my life. Well, a series of products, really, all by way of my friends at FreezePipe. If you're a marijuana enjoyer like I am, you'll no doubt know that even after years, smoking can be kind of harsh. As I get older, I'm not trying to live the Cheech and Chong lifestyle anymore, as fun as that may have been. Instead, these days, I actually smoke largely to regulate my anxiety and to help me sleep, and my FreezePipe bong, bubbler, and bowl have provided amazing accompaniment that makes taking a hit practically comical in comparison to the normal pieces I may use. The secret is in Freeze Pipe's glycerin chambers, artfully used throughout their line to help substantially reduce the harshness of your smoke. How? It's simple. By placing your bong, bowl, and so on into the freezer for an hour or two before use, Freeze Pipe comes to life, allowing its glycerin chambers to reduce your smoke's temperature by up to an insane 300 degrees Fahrenheit, making your hit winter cool, easily the smoothest hits you've ever experienced. Freeze Pipe's wares are extremely well made out of high quality components, backed by solid engineering and impatiently waiting to cut the harshness out of your next session. I'm telling you, my Freeze Pipe products had me completely abandon my old favorite companies and with good reason. Freeze Pipe is superior, period. American owned and with over 100,000 happy customers, Freeze Pipe is your solution to smoke like royalty without paying a king's ransom. Shop now at thefreezepipe.com. That's T-H-E-F-R-E-E-Z-E-P-I-P-E.com. And use the code DUKE, that's D-U-K-E, for 10% off your entire order. That's thefreezepipe.com with the checkout code DUKE for 10% off. Order today to get free shipping and say goodbye to harsh smoke forever at thefreezepipe.com with the checkout code DUKE. All right. We got some new words from Jim Ryan, former head of PlayStation. He did an interview with CNBC talking about the Call of Duty deal. And I thought what he said was interesting. I wanted to get your thoughts, Cog, especially corporate Cog here. Quote, you know what? We're at risk of getting very granular here, but there are deals and deals. And you know, the deal that was offered at a certain point in time may not have been the deal that was actually signed. We were absolutely thrilled to be able to negotiate a deal with Microsoft to ensure that the franchise remains on PlayStation platforms for the next 10 years. And that was very important to us. We're very happy to have done that deal, end quote. <laughs> Jim, you got to stop. You got to stop, bro. I hate it. Like, stop. Stop, bro. Like, he's like, like, he's like that uh, retired talent from like a good sports team that's still like rooting on from the sidelines yeah. on social media. <laughs> I get it, bro. You, you know, corporate speak. I get it. It's like, we know damn well y'all had a very similar deal initially. You know what I mean? So at that point, you were in a position of leverage. You thought you could block the deal. You thought it could happen. It looked it very well looked like it was going to be blocked, right? We we how many defining dukes 
was that oh damn Call God. of Duty. It feels like t- so long ago. Oh, I'm actually happy to be out of that malaise. Of yeah, having- yeah, once it stopped, our show grew oh. a ton because like we were finally able to just talk about some new stuff. Bro, that yeah. was Lord Acquisition phase. That was the death of the industry phase. That was we can't survive without Call of Duty. It was just so much going on at that time. And it was just every week was just a court case and a new finding and a new country. Tracking about, Jim Ryan's flights. Tracking the flight. He's at Brussels now. Oh, that was, <laughs> then who's got the pseudo? There was Lulu updates every five minutes. Remember that? that like, yeah. bro, that was a time. Yeah. Like, we're out of that finally. But yeah. The like, best thing that came from Xbox's business update is so much less of that yes so much less of that so shit. glad because the community was let's be honest community was split everybody was angry fighting yeah. each other it was just crazy but yeah. jim we we know that the deal was very similar <laughs> to what you had initially and initially we know off record that you weren't even you weren't even fearful of them having call of duty you were like hey what well, we got with bungie well, we, we felt we, we got all these things we got going on ada, ada, ada. Mm-hmm. and then once you you knew that hey wait a minute We've got some leverage. We could block this thing. And I'm not even mad at that. Corporate cock is never mad at that. Like, do what you got to do to protect your interest. But then once that failed and then we knew what the the actual hurdle was, was we, I feel the, the critical part, I would say, was the EU. Because yeah. once the EU, that was like, because remember, they, the Xbox was going down. It was, yeah. see, it was looking good. CMA, remember Phil had to come to the Game Awards with the block face? <laughs> it was, block face. Remember the block face. They had my man out of pocket. They had him with the block face sitting yeah, there. And it was just depressed <laughs> in his seat. <laughs> Bro, I was not, you know what I'm saying? I remember it. Like, it was yesterday. And then, like I said, the EU, that was the lifeline. Life started turning around. And then we saw eventually, you know, the FCC and the CMA and all the thing else fell in line. But, yeah, it, that's what it is. So, we, we get it. And now that you're happy to have done the deal, okay, great. That's that's <laughs> what we anticipated to happen once it went through. So yeah, we, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just thought his answer, not answer, was, was yeah, too it's good. funny. Too that, good. That's a good. I, I did not catch this. I'm so glad you put this in. Here. Well, it was funny because I I like Pure Xbox a lot, and they they yeah. put it in as an article. Like Jim Ryan opens up. On his on a Call of Duty, I'm like, he didn't say shit. <laughs> it's like there are deals and there are deals, and we signed a deal. I'm like, you don't say. <laughs> you don't say. Oh man, too funny. All right, next up here, Erebon Shadow Legacy. This game was announced. Ah uh, man, I want to say for Game Pass a showcase or two ago, but nonetheless, it's no longer set to be day one on Xbox Game Pass as Raw Fury is no longer the publisher of this game. And here's what developer Baby Robot Games had to say on the matter. Quote, unfortunately, due to recent changes in our partnership with Raw Fury as our publisher, the release of Erebon Shadow Legacy on Xbox and Game Pass on day one got canceled. However, please rest assured that we will do our best to bring Erebon to Xbox as soon as possible. End quote. I apologize. I misread. Also, no Xbox release. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that that Uh, part. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, sorry. My bad. So this shows that Xbox is pretty much, I think, individually bankrolling the port for Airbon Shadow Legacy with that Game Pass bag, effectively, oh, which wow. is uh, an interesting revelation in that. But uh, yeah, a very, very fascinating to see. Cog, what do you feel about how things went here where a publisher pulls out, a Game Pass deal is lost, and in turn, Xbox loses a game? Very strange. Very strange. I, I Got to get more research as far as the, the publisher change. Do we have any idea as to what happened was it a funding issue like i've never really heard that like i will dig a little deeper here i'm gonna send you just so you can see it please do the announcement trailer um this was at the 2022 xbox showcase Mm -hmm. uh this game does look really good by the way which is why it's a shame like you have this Oh, yeah, character yeah, that can kind of like travel in the shadows like that's I the way you're able to navigate this yes uh, yeah, i it, remember it looks, this it yeah cool. it looks really good yeah. it looked oh, really good man. i recommend people who are listening just take a moment to look up arabon shadow legacy Ooh, um lots with the search and, and reconnect and with what you're not going to be able to get because it's, <laughs> it's a it's a pretty big change yeah, it was a cool it was a cool joint like it, it definitely had that you know in the potential, but what I liked is the cell shaded style, the, the the very stealth, dark, a little bit of I'm gonna say cyberpunkish, but it, it looked cool. It, it looked like this had a lot of potential. And you know me, the ninja in me, love the coming from the shadows, coming out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. A little origami to it too. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, it looked like you know a little indie joint that had a potential. So yeah, we got we got to do a little bit of research as to what. Happened it's coming out with the publisher though on PC April tenth. Uh, mm. No PC Game Pass, might I add. Mm. Yeah, why is 
So Raw Fury is no longer the po- publisher. And now, what is it? The it doesn't develop- say, mm-hmm. from what I can tell. Yeah, because if you look at their Steam page, um, I don't know if it's updated, but it says Baby, Ro- right? Baby Robot is the developer, developer and publisher. And publisher. Yeah. yeah, so it looks like they, they lost might the have publisher. moved into self-publishing. Yeah, that's what it is. I had to assume that's what it feels like. Yeah, it's mm. tough to tell, but since they never confirmed that. Yeah. Hey, we just announced, they wrote on their Twitter account, we just announced that Erebon Shadow Legacy is set to launch on PC on April 10th. Check out mm-hmm. these fresh screenshots shots to get a glimpse of what's coming. I guess my question is like, how does that work if you contractually, the publisher contractually had an agreement to a game pass back and then are able to get out of that? Yeah, that's the, that's the interesting part here, right? Because the deal had to be between Raw Fury and and xbox. And the xbox yeah and that gets shut down i have to assume work was done on the xbox port no i mean it's right where That's where they're I'm just doing. abandoning potentially millions of dollars of work right. just like that um and then, and then why would the publisher pull out yeah right or, That's, I mean, and you can't imagine xbox was the one canceling it so why oh yeah yeah, why did they pull? Especially Wait. because if they were publishing, I mean, it depends. Every situation's a little different, right? Like, I don't right. know how much upfront payments Baby Robot Games did for their own mm-hmm. development, like what their bank was looking like. If, say, Raw Fury is brought out almost as a liaison, like, hey, get us a right. Game Pass deal and right. help us publish this game on platforms. And there is something to be said about like a known name putting your game out there. Like when people see Default for Digital, it's like oh, absolutely shit. okay, cool. absolutely. You know, there's like a a statement to that. So I don't know if it was that or if they were helping fund the game. I imagine if they were helping really fund the game, they wouldn't have let it go because you got to recoup your assets, right? So right. it's tough to guess what's going on yeah. here. I, I'd be fascinated to learn more. I, it's an indie sci-fi stealth platforming game. So I imagine we're not going to get like a big report on it, but hopefully right. we get some answers of some kind yeah, here. I'll follow the Twitter account. I'll definitely want to pin this one for us to come back to. This is yeah. very interesting because clearly Xbox, whether it be ID at Xbox or, you know, Xbox in general, who sponsors the Game Pass team, clearly saw enough in this title to what this part of their stable. Yeah. Right. That's how I look at it. I look at it like, yo, this showed something to that team that said, OK, this could be a gin here. We work. We want to associate our brand with you. So, mm-hmm. yeah, this we got to put our, put our uh, fingers on this one and just see if we get more information as time goes on. Yeah. with This particular dev. We'll definitely monitor it. Next up here, we talked about Sea of Thieves as our main subject last week, and uh, check this timing out, Cog. Sea of Thieves is getting a deluxe edition at forty nine ninety nine U.S. dollars and a premium edition at fifty nine ninety nine U.S. dollars, as the game is set to release soon on PlayStation. There is also a brand new Game Pass SKU called the twenty twenty four edition, which adds some digital bonuses like the inclusion of the Sea of Thieves soundtrack, Athena's Fortune audiobook, and the Rough Guide to Sea of Thieves ebook. The deluxe edition includes this quote, in addition to a wealth of bonus content, ocean crawler, cutlass, pistol, shovel, hat, jacket, dress, trousers, hook, and 10,000 gold. This edition of the game comes with a further deluxe bundle containing the collector's thunderous fury figurehead, collector's thunderous fury sales and shrouded ghost hunter blunderbuss end quote. Meanwhile, for the premium edition, they write, quote, in addition to a wealth of bonus content from the revised game and 2024 deluxe edition, this edition of the game comes with a further premium bundle containing the collector's Dark Warsmith figurehead and sales, the Dark Warsmith hole, flag, wheel, capstan, ca- uh, cannons, and cannon flare, as well as the Dark Warsmith costume and menacing diabolical dog pet, end quote. So, Cog, you have this number one pre-ordered game on playstation and wow. they're like let's get some versions out there let's yeah. get some, some new yeah. skews out there let's yeah. get some money in our pockets right and uh mm-hmm. just curious as to corporate cogs thoughts on the business savvy move here by xbox to launch some new additions alongside their playstation release again showing this was not a knee-jerk thing uh, this has been in the plans for a long while yeah, I think someone corporate cog is secretly it's someone with corporate cog secretly rejoicing. See, I told you, I told you, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, we'll get the blowback now. But look at the vision. Look what it's doing. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> you know what was surprising to me, Maddie? I didn't realize not only was the number one, it was the number one pre-order. That was the premium edition. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, wow. And guess what was number five? Standard Sea of Thieves. Wow. Bro, 
Wow. Okay. Someone is chuckling to corporate cops. I told you. <laughs> I told you they're going to complain, but they don't represent the masses. The hardcore don't represent. Look what's happening. Again, one game, not MPD yet. Pre orders are a good indicator. They're, they're, they're nice. They're nice sure. for the platform. We got to see the other ones. We know Hi Fi Rush just came out there. We got to see how that does. We talked about Last Duke. You know, Grounded is something I also want to see. You know, um, it, it's it's surprising. It's a problem. But to this point now, let's fast forward to now where we're doing the deluxe edition. So basically how I look at it is cross promotion, like cross platform promotion, because it's like, yo, the PlayStation community is going to know about it. They're hype. They get the premium and they get early access five days, by the way. Mm. They get early access. Five um, days. Bro. Like, so the Xbox community is like, welcome. You get early access to what we've been playing <laughs> already. Right? That's insane. insane. Early access to a game that's been out since, what, 2017? <laughs> so what does that tell you, Matty? That tells oh, you that the boy. PlayStation community, look, let's just call it what it is. And I'm getting a lot of hate for this. But I agree with King. King says crazy stuff, but this part, I 100% agree. It's like, no matter what, there's certain people that just like, yo, we're not coming over there, bro. We not coming over there, bro. Like, it, it, and oh, now it's hot. Yeah. <laughs> like, when it's on the system, the controller I like, the dual rumble sense I like. Okay, right. I love it now. I want it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This game is out now. Been out. Forget it. We need to get Ben on the show, right? Like Ben could have been Ben the Smith, one of the best people here at LSM has been screaming the praises of this game for the longest, right? So it goes to show you. We've teased him about it. We've teased him about it. He always laughs at us on our lack of knowledge. He probably, we probably got some stuff wrong too that he could educate us on as well. But it just goes to show you how people are tied to their ecosystem. That's what this shows you. So maybe there was some clear voice with Xbox to say, you know what? Maybe this is the Trojan horse that we do. Mm. They don't want to come over. They don't want to buy the console. They don't... We put it over, put a few over there. Let's see what happens. And then we bank out because now they're going to come up with this deluxe edition, this premium edition and all this other stuff for the Xbox. It, this is very fascinating to me, bro. Like, I, mm. I, I am really surprised by this. Not this level. And it goes, last point, like I said last week, it goes to show you we don't, the hardcore does not represent the majority of gamers. It really doesn't. It really doesn't. The casual gamers like, oh, no, no, we want this. We, we, we want to play. And mm. we're willing to pay premium mm. for it. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's uh, it, you know we already saw some of the early tea leaves here suggesting that this was going to be a big one. Uh, maybe we'll hear more about Hi-Fi Rush, which just came out as we're recording this. It's out on PlayStation now. Reviews are out doing really well. So the port seems to have gone well. We had a couple of Duke listeners writing that oh, uh, the man. haptic feedback or the uh, the adaptive trigger, sorry, yes. the way that they use the dual sense was pretty nifty here with uh, with Hi-Fi Rush. So. You know, I'm curious to see how that game does well, um, sorry, how, good, how that game does and if it does well. Right. Uh, but looks like Sea of Thieves and Grounded might be the ones that bubble to the top is, is at least our prediction here. Um, and then again, it's this is just the beginning, everyone. Yeah, not to be redundant, not to be yeah. repetitive with the things I say all the time. But yeah, truly, that is my one takeaway from this. I'm like, oh, someone's yeah. rubbing their hands going, look at that. Just look at that. Yeah. what's and next remember, the duke said it we you've you've been very consistent with this you like we ain't fooling ourselves <laughs> the ticket is just these four you get this type of success and it happens consistently you know i'm not fooling myself it so just needs to happen once these games are made right like i'm not saying a port is easy but it's easier than making a whole game from the ground up and right. while you're making it for playstation like you're right. just bringing something existing over to more people right again right. I'm, I'm putting my money on forza i'm saying i think for <laughs> it's just such an easy cash bag there i mean look. just like sea of thieves right there's that that diehard community mm -hmm. and that's even bigger on forza right now you know look you're not when it comes to just pure money we already know that you know forza and halo makes the most sense we we, we know that we're not you know so i guess there's a part of me, I was listening to Shout to Jazz, you know, you know, this coverage has come up a lot. And he's mm -hmm. been kind of like, as far as I know, just these four, you know, and that's it, and see how the experiment go. But there is a part of me that's like, if the experiment goes this well, right? Mm -hmm. Who's to say how quickly other things could accelerate, right? And I'm not trying to fear monger or get people in a state. I'm just trying to think of the reality of business, you know. So we'll see. We'll see what happens, you know. But um, yeah, this is very interesting data check. Last step will be for me i can't wait for npd or sort of kind of what they call the following i want to know what them numbers did 
Yeah. I same. really want to know. I also think Killer Instinct is a really good selection. Get the definitive yeah. edition or the anniversary edition over to Xbox yeah. or to PlayStation. Breathe some life into that fighting game franchise again. Oh, yeah. Multiplayer, live service, multiplayer, all that. Co- that it makes sense. I, I've always been on the side, side of that. I, and I'm curious to see how far Rush, though, if it does or it doesn't, because that's a, even though it's a cool IP, it's single. But what is interesting, I don't know, have you seen the Metacritics, bro? They're higher than Xbox, right? <laughs> and, and now the Xbox media is not tight because they're like, bro, come on. Now it's a 90. Like, there's. I don't want to get into the tax stuff, but you know where people going, right? Yeah, I, you know I, where people I going. I understand. I, I've listened to the, what people have said. <laughs> I see it. There's only like, I think, eight reviews or something true, like that. True, so true, I'm true, like, correct, okay, correct. guys, the, this could go down like three points. It could be lower than the Xbox Bro, score with one measly the review. Tiki torches are out like, oh, now it's... Bro, I, I hate to I, get, I just think it's funny. I have to admit, there's, a, there's I have humor with a lot of this stuff. Of course, of so course. it's good to monitor and see. But... We will say, you know, experience exposing people. This is how I felt on it. There's going to be people, and I said we've talked about it before, that when they review games, they review them primarily on a PlayStation platform. That's just a fact. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And we've talked about this at those times. So, you know, if you're in that that ecosystem at that point, you've never really experienced anything else, and now it comes to your ecosystem that in the place where you like to play games, mm-hmm. you know, that affects things. So. That may be how a reflective of, of the masses in terms of brand recognition with Sony. Absolutely. So uh, we'll see how things go. For now, we talk about Pocket Pair, who is interested in being acquired. These are the developers of Pal World, and their CEO, Takuro Mizobe, spoke to Bloomberg about potentially being acquired. The CEO admits he's open to an acquisition or partnership, but not just with Microsoft. The most important aspect is that Pocket Pair wishes to remain a small studio making multiple small games. He states that big budget AAA games are not for them. Takaro also mentions here that the team is working on bringing Power World to more platforms beyond Xbox and PC, which is something you and I both predicted was inevitably going to happen, especially with the dramatic success that Power World was. So Lord Cognito, Lord Acquisition, dare I say. What are your thoughts on Microsoft spending a little bit on what is right now still, I believe, 2024's best selling game mm-hmm. in Power World? Now, for the record, Lord Acquisition did not uh, attach this to Microsoft. <laughs> for the record, this is this is Power World Pocket Pair themselves putting it out in the universe. Hey, we would like that. Don't go after my man. Exactly. So don't get mad at me that the developers are saying, and that's all I'm saying. Companies, people always forget. Acquisition is a two-way street, y'all. It's a two-way street. You got to want to be acquired. And, you know, it has to work both ways. It has to be mutual. But it is interesting. I, I do agree with them in the sense that, you know, this game is huge. It should be on multiple platforms. It's the Pokemon that, you know, everybody, the mature Pokemon that everybody kind of wanted. And, um, you know, it seems like the support for the most part is still going good. I was surprised at how much of the Xbox uh, player base when they were showing how many millions of players and people were actually interacting was pretty impressive. Remember, this is still a game preview game from my understanding. The full Mm -hmm. release has not come out yet. A lot of potential here. A lot of potential. Um, I think if I'm Microsoft, you still have to be wary and I know this is weird from Lord Acquisition saying this, Mm -hmm. but you have to be wary only because Nintendo is outside and those lawyers and the legality, I think they're fine. I agree with Hogue, but it does pose risk because the last thing you want to do is acquire something that you think is the next big thing and then end up in some legal battle where you end up owing Nintendo, blah, blah. You see how Nintendo coming from these emulators. They coming from, now granted, this is not emulation, but we do know the similarities with a lot of these characters that people like, bro, you flying a little too close to the sun with your character yeah, designs. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I think that may be the only thing that keeps them. So if I was Microsoft, I'm surprised everybody that keep it where it's at. Do the partnership. You have your extended window, whether it be, you know, content or exclusivity, whatever. Let them eventually open up, you know, to PlayStation or whatever. And I think they'll be fine. I think they'll, they'll literally be fine. But, uh, yeah, this this is one. If you're Microsoft, you got to be just a little careful. Just you, you can't just throw the bag random at them because, you know, we, we don't know what could happen when the full release. Because maybe there's some legality. I get up this. Guess I would have to speak the whole that it's in game preview also. And it's the fact that it's not a full release yet. 
in terms of the whole controversy. But we'll see. We'll see. What do you think? What do you think about all this? I agree with you. I, I think mm-hmm. you you keep it where it's at, um, especially because. I'm glad Power World is as successful as it was for Pal for Pocket Pair, especially for such a small company. But there's something just weird about this company. Not on a creative level, like we've talked about extensively with as you mentioned, flying a little too close to the sun. Like that's just like a personal level distaste. But like I, I was reading in this interview here, I got it up right now, that they made so much money they said it's too big for a studio with our size to handle. And the game has had over 25 million players. Some through Game Pass, not all, um, but it's a thirty dollar game, right? And he said in this interview that the development was around uh, budget was around six point seven million dollars, and now they've made tens of billions of yen in profit, which he says is simply too big for a studio with our size to handle. And I know they're not embarking on like large scale, but they just. The way they communicate, especially when they were under fire for the Pokemon comparisons, uh, they flounder a lot. They seem, they, I mean, they seem like a small team. They kind of seem amateur is how I look at it. And I feel like if you're Xbox, you benefit from what they bring to your platform, especially now after Power World. I think a lot of eyes will be on what they do next, especially with how much money they got. It should be on what they do next because it'll probably look like a complete game, you'd hope. Um but you you look at what they're doing here at Pocket Pair, and I, I feel like you just benefit from that, and you don't try to get too close because I just feel like they're one lawsuit away or one stupid mistake away from being far less relevant than they currently are. Uh, so that's where I stand on Pocket Pair. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. I, I totally understand. I'll try to look at the uh, man. The damn PC stores all over the place. The PC Game Pass store. Like I'm like, what's uh, you got to get this together. I'm trying to get like it's so easily organizable with Xbox console game pass to see what's the most po- popular. Whatever, whatever. It's still on the list, but I just don't know the ranking. I, I, is League of Legends rocking like that? Is that number one? I, it's got to be. I got to look at how this is sorted. So anyway, but it's still up there as far as, um you know, trending game as far as game pass on PC. So that, that that's big for them. But yeah, I, I agree with pretty much everything you said on that part. Well, let's talk about the Fallout TV show. Ooh. Interesting update here for the Fallout TV show. Jonathan Nolan, the director of at least the first three episodes and co-creator of the Fallout TV show series, had this to say when talking about pleasing Fallout fans with the release of season one coming April 11th, quote, I don't think you could really set out to please the fans of anything or please anyone other than yourself. I think you have come into this, you have to come into this, sorry, trying to make the show that you want to make and trusting that as fans of the game ourselves, we want to find the pieces that were essential to us and try to do the best version. I don't think you can really set out to please the fans of anything or please anyone other than yourself. I think you have to come into this trying to make the show that you wanted to make and trusting that is, wait, did I double? Did I, did I copy and paste the same quote twice? <laughs> oh my God. I was like, why? You know, it's funny. Cause I made a video on this and I was like, well, I, I was like, this looks way longer than anything I used before. I apologize. I was on a complete no, robot mode for that next sentence there. you good. All right, let me go ahead and skip to the next part here. All right, here we go. Found here it. Go. For me, with Fallout 3, which devoured about a year of my life, he recalled the moment he found and got hooked to the game. I was an aspiring young writer at that point and almost derailed my entire career. It's so ludicrously playable and fun. Seriously, the games were just incredible. It's such a rare and unbelievable thing that I've gotten to do uh, to p- twice in my career to take something that you love and get a chance to play around in that universe to create your own version. The first round for me was Batman. And this time was a fallout, a series of games that I absolutely loved. So cog in that kerfuffle there, what I was trying to say is that Jonathan Nolan is saying that pleasing fans is not something you can really do, but as fans of the show ourselves or the games of ourselves, uh, we want to go out and make something that we would like. And if we like it, other people should like it. Uh, as we've watched more and more video game adaptations roll out, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this one because we have examples of not pleasing the fans like Halo, and we have examples of pleasing the fans like Cyberpunk Edge Runners, and we've seen the effects that each have had on the franchise and the the view of them. So, what do you make of what Jonathan Nolan, who's clearly a fan of Fallout Three, we're not sure about his other Fallout related fanships, but um, seems to like the series, saying that. Pleasing the fans isn't really number one priority. We just got to make something we like, and I happen to like what I made, so therefore, it's all good. 
got to be careful with those statements, in my opinion. <laughs> um, look, you, you've got this IP under your stewardship for the reason of its popularity. Let's be clear, right? Like, there's a reason why this is being made because people see value. And that was brought to you by the fans. <laughs> so, so again, you know, you may feel you want to make something for yourself, but the reality is eyeballs are tuning into this beloved franchise because they want to see the lore and it respected. So I probably wouldn't have told him to make, Corporate Card wouldn't have told him to make this statement. I would have said, Mm-mm, keep that to yourself, buddy, yep. because yep. even though your intentions may be pure, it can be misconstrued that you go and do what you want to do. I don't care about your feelings. And that's the last thing I would like. I would want to put on him, even if he doesn't feel that way. He may not feel that way. But, um, you know, look. You want to listen, it, it's a in his defense is a fine line, right? It, we there's sometimes you some things don't translate on the TV and film and you got to make some adaptations. You got to make some adjustments. I get that. But it's like. You know, there's also things that people are near and dear coy. You've got to get down. You've got to nail. And in defense of the TV series, we what we see look good so far. It look really good. So I don't want to go in on him. I personally would not have made that statement or his PR team would have told me, keep that one to yourself. Yeah. Bro, because I don't want this to be because this, this show looks dope. In the, the, in the team's defense, it looks cool. Just, just that, that, that part. Did you like see that. the the clip that came out, like the two minute clip of uh, oh, new joint. Yeah, there was like oh, a I little, see the new joint. Oh, it was like actually movie. of the show, just you know, no trailers or anything, just like the show running. It was uh, Ooh. it was the vault dweller, the ghoul vault, uh, the ghoul bounty hunter, and uh, this brother to steel knight, pretty much Ooh. facing off, and it was pretty solid. Like it was kind of imperfect, but that was what was sort of charming about it. Um, the vault dweller was was hilariously awful at convincing the ghoul that what he was doing wasn't worth it um <laughs> and then i made a joke that i think a lot of people didn't like just because it, it kind of ruined the scene for them not in like a serious way like fuck you maddie but like yeah. they're like damn i can't get that out of my head now is that the brotherhood of seal knights sound like emperor zerg and wow i i heard it and i was like i remember lock because lock sent me the clip i was sitting there and he was like oh looks good right i was like dude i fucking hate how they sound i hate how they sound. It's not a big deal, but I hate it. And like, I, <laughs> I immediately I heard it. Emperor Zerg and I looked up Soy Story 2. He's like, yes, Buzz, come to me. And I'm like, oh, no, it sounds just like him. So I, yeah, I, then I checked myself. I went to Fallout 3, listened to the mm. clip there. I was like, let okay. me see what the Brotherhood of Steel sounds like. Sounded like, yeah. I was like, no, it does sound different. And mm. not in a way I like, because it sounds like a voice changer that's kind of, eh, when you listen to Fallout 4 even, it's it's very mechanical, very modulated. And this is like, come to me if you want to live. Like, I'm just like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, got you, I got you. But I, this is maybe, I say all that because they said this in my video. This is maybe what Jonathan Nolan's talking about. Why the fuck would he want to please someone like me? He'd be like, dude, really? Look at everything we did. All right, fair, fair. Look at everything we fair. did. Set, story, characterization, writing. That's what you're complaining about? So I'm like, okay, I kind of get it, dude. I kind of get it. Uh, but I agree with you, Cog, that it's like, you got to be careful because I, I look at cyberpunk edge runners as like the crown jewel of look what happens when you do respect that core fan base and you do it right. And you and you make something that's heavily leading into the game and its sensibilities uh, while branching out in its own way. Right. Like some people think that the edge runner story is better than what cyberpunk's main story, by the way, without Phantom Liberty offered at the time. Um and I get it, but also it was because they leaned into so many of the sensibilities that were there and established in the core game and then focused more on like cybernetics and the hu the impacts they have on humans and total story through that. Um, and that spoke so much that it, it skyrocketed cyberpunk up the charts across the board. Uh, so I think it's it's really important that we try not to walk away from the fans that make these games uh, make these shows even possible in the first place because right. they'll be the first to champion you. And I don't know if I've heard, I think of arcane apparently is really good. I don't know. I've, I've heard of a show that's based on a game series, stepping away from the source material and being better off for it. Maybe halo, because that was paramount plus biggest right. launch ever with the first season. Right. Right. Yes. That but is correct. Maybe and halo, maybe halo. And, and, and I got to give the halo bros, they're, they're due right now. 
every person that is watching season two, whether it be a person who has been on my side that has been hated the first one or a person that loved the first one and was like, oh, it was too hard. The consensus is so far, it is fantastic. Mm. So I got to get on Halo season two. I got to get to that. I probably try to do that on maybe on the, on the ride up there. So I'm trying to sneak a couple episodes. Oh, up. boy. Yeah. I thought so, we yeah. talked about enjoying yourself going out to your <laughs> trip, man. What are you talking about? You're going to watch the Halo TV show. Yo, it's too many people. People I respect that like, nah, it's, it's fire. It's fire. I'm like, all right, all right, we're going to get to it. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Next up, we got Leo Olebe. Former YouTube and Facebook executive has joined Xbox as the new VP of Global Partnerships. Just wanted to call this one out here. Phil actually gave him a public welcoming on mm-hmm. x or twitter whatever the hell you want to call it and so mm-hmm. uh a new person ha- heading up the global partnerships at xbox cog any thoughts even if they're brief on this one because i yeah, personally have not much to add yeah just more so you know obviously the role with executive with global partnerships is huge for them and um you know looking briefly at his history he was i believe at um bioware also he's at bioware he's oh, at um yeah zynga water brothers game so you know extensive history um to join the team so we'll see he said what is it looking for for the opportunity to join the amazing team the incredible future of games and xbox look he's got his work cut out from a global standpoint you know i i really want them to improve you know we, we've heard i don't know what his role specifically be in terms of like um brand recognition globally but like they really need to improve as a global brand we just have to be honest they, they're still noted as the, you know, the United States brand, <laughs> you know, completely. And, and the European one has been waning. So I'm very curious to see what op- what strategies that he would like to implement and work with that team and see what they're working on. Because that's something we've been screaming for a long, a long time. Well said. Halo Infinite has a March update coming your way. Seven new maps have been added to the squad battle playlist featuring a mix of new and old as there are remakes from Halo Combat Evolved and 4 here. There are faster, ban- faster bandit reloads, more viable commando, and Gravity Hammer's double damage reign has come to an end, according to the Halo Waypoint post. I think this is the biggest one. New networking model to address desync, among other top reported bugs, and easy anti-cheat has been enhanced. Uh, that third bullet point, desync, that has been a complaint since the game first came out. That is a complaint since day one. That and There were videos going viral of how bad it was. So let's hope this puts an end to that. Interesting to see how long it took. Would love to know why it took that long. That was like complaint number one uh, with Halo Infinite. But Cog, what do you think of a pretty beefy March update for Halo Infinite? Yeah, this is core gameplay stuff. And again, network restructure, anti-cheat. That's what I wanted to hear. Get the core Fix. And like you said it, we didn't heard about desyncing for so long. Yeah. So the vibe I got, this must have been a really arduous task for them to get this thing done. So yeah, they got that. They got the squad battle refresh. They got I'm always a sucker for weapon tuning. I'm gonna be honest. Even in, mm-hmm. in all my live service games, I always like that because I feel like after the meta has settled, you kind of have an idea, okay, what is a little too strong and what needs to be buffed. So yeah, they look like um heat waves about to get that smoke. So all you heat wave dudes <laughs> gonna get that aim assist fall off, that right. range. You know what I'm saying? Looks like oh my plasma pa- I'm a I'm a fan of plasma pistols getting a little buff. Come on now. Mm-hmm. There's like, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it, it's they they're they're changing the way the single shot works, faster charge up time and slightly decreased rate of fire for single shots. So they, you do the hard charge up, but, you know, rate of fire is a little slower. So they just, you know, they, they, they change, they're messing around with things. And it, it's way, one thing I have to give them this, though, before we go, mm-hmm. 343, Bungie is, is got better at this, but 343, when it comes to patch notes, is the most extensive bit of minutia you are <laughs> going to get about how these guns function and what's going to happen. Salute to the T. I have to give them that when it comes yeah. to some notes, oh, if you love a game, you're going to get some notes with 343. Yeah. You, you're going to learn all the mechanics of how it works. It's a science. And, yeah, and Bungie has always been very obtuse. And you're like, well, what does 10% more aim assist mean? Like, like they just weird with certain mm-hmm. things, but no, this is good. This is good. It's just stuff that, you know, we wanted to, to happen for a while, but we, we're glad it's here. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> 
Grandia HD Collection is finally coming to Xbox on March 26th. It's been out on Switch for a while. Limited Run will be handling the distribution of physical copies. The pre-order is ongoing right now if you're interested in that. But uh, yeah, this is an action JRPG series. It's coming to Xbox. So they're gradually, you know, catching us up on the times. I, I still find the weird omission to be Mega Man Battle Network Legacy yeah, Collection. I, I get Capcom that. in the mix as they've been in yeah. the mix for this whole time. But it's good to see Grandia's coming over. This is a series I have no knowledge on whatsoever. I just know there's a lot Same. of people who revere it quite highly, think it's amazing. So it's something I do want to check out, but it's coming to Xbox March 26. Yeah, man, come on. Because Grandia is it's still Capcom, right? This is all part of the Capcom umbrella or no? Uh, I don't know what Gra- who published Grandia, actually. You might want to double check that. Yeah. Professional podcasting, you know. Yes. So I'm <laughs> doing a little bit of that today. Yeah, we all doing it. We all doing it. Let's see. Grandia, why do I feel? Who is the pub? Uh, no, Um, looks like. Oh, that's correct. Gung Ho? Gung Ho Online? Yeah, that's a developer, I'm pretty sure. That's the developer, but who's the pub on this one? Because I know Limited Rain's got the thing, but eh, no, no biggie. We'll find, figure it out. I don't know why I was thinking Capcom. I just wanted to make sure I was correct with that. Let's see. Mm-mm-mm. Hey, it says Gung Ho. You're right. Publisher yeah. Gung Ho Online Entertainment America. Okay. Fair enough. There you go. What it is. There you go. No <laughs> doubt. No, look, any, anything that's missing, we like on the platform. Yes, absolutely. After 30 years with PlayStation, Connie Booth is moving on to EA to become their group general manager action RPG. That's literally her job title. And she will overlook EA Motives, Iron Man, Cliffhangers, Black Panther, and Bioware's Dragon Age and Mass Effect. So this is a pretty big get for for EA. Uh, And this is a lot of people find this. I noticed the, the news is really attached to Bioware. Like everyone wants someone to go in and, and fix Bioware, especially now with uh, Dragon Age uh, Dreadwolf impending, uh, apparently coming out this year with a big reveal in the summer. Um, this is a game that a lot of people want Bioware to nail. So a lot of people attached her success throughout PlayStation's uh, clearly phenomenal first party output. Getting her in EA after 30 years is a is a pretty big deal there. So it's a good get for them. And, and hopefully we see it make a difference in their in their release quality, which I imagine EA is going to 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 really be taking a strong look at, especially after they've kind of shifted some things with layoffs. Any thoughts on uh, Connie Booth joining EA? Yeah, this is huge to me. Um, I want to shout out um, Lord David Chaffee, who we had in the realm of IMP not that long ago, and this was right around the time when the uh, Booth Connie Booth news about her leaving PlayStation or exiting in whatever fashion, and he really highlighted the importance of how she was the pulse of PlayStation and how responsible she was for the quality of the games mm. that launched during their hey. And, um, you know, 30 years, man, from the OG, like, that's a long time. So this is huge. I don't want to understate this because we all know EA, especially, you know, with Bioware and things of that nature in, ter- in terms of their structure and trying to meet that quality bar. Yeah. And f- the vibe I get is she like almost like the finish. She gets it done. Mm. Right. So I'm very curious to see one. Her One, I like the fact that she landed on her feet. Two, EA could use that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And they've got a lot of friends. And for me, I guess this gives me a little bit more hope towards my beloved Mass Effect. And you know, I'm I'm dying to get her input and see how they handle it. We saw that initial trailer, you know, conceptually what they want to do. But, you know, this is a beloved franchise. You have to treat this thing with the, the respect it deserves. And I, I like the fact that they have someone with that type of tenure, that type of experience in control. So salute to Connie. But I've heard so many good things. I almost got to beat you now because the things I've heard about her from multiple people, but Jaffe especially, mm. really made it resonate how significant because he told me he's like cog you guys don't realize what you're losing at place that you have no idea and this is a person who's been in the trenches with her for a long time as well as other people that are supposed yeah, to you would know better scenes. than anyone right yeah he, he sings her praise i think him and um um colin also did a show because i think it was that that week it was like everybody wanted to speak to jaffe we were like yo you know who why is she so important why is she so significant colin had her on we, i mean, had him on and then we had jaffe on and he really broke it down it was a fantastic show all right. Mm-hmm. What do we have next here? Sandland demo. Last bit of news before we talk about what we're playing here is available now. Kaz did risk writes in. 
Hey, Dukes, a demo for Sandland is available on PC and consoles, including Xbox. And if I'm curious if both of you have had a chance to play it. And if so, what are your thoughts? Maddie, I know as a fan of Akira Toriyama, this game must be somewhat exciting for you. Take care and have a, it's all in caps, by the way, super day, which I like. It's a nah. good little touch there. Dragon Ball Super Nod. Cog. Sandland looks great. Like, I, I haven't played it yet. I checked for the demo to see if the saves carry over. It doesn't. That's kind of like a big need for me. Like the only demos I typically play are like whenever Square Enix does like an HD 2D game. They did it with Live Alive. They did it with um, with Octopath. Uh, there's a few other examples out there, but save carryover is huge for me. Like I can't, especially when demos are so big, like Unicorn Overlord had a demo that some people were saying could go for like eight hours. Bro, like it was, was huge. Yeah, he was going in on it. I was yeah. like, damn, that long? Yeah, yeah, it's a long demo, which is really cool of them. It was really, really cool of them. But that demo was important because you could then carry your save over afterwards. So that time you spent wasn't lost. And so with Sandland, uh, seeing that you'd get bonuses if you played the demo, that's cool and all, but I'm good. I'm already sold on art style and gameplay alone. This game really looks... It looks like an answer to what I've been asking for for a while with anime style games, which is like they're all 3D fighters. Give us something different. This is very vehicular focused, kind of open world, very mechy. It's got all of that Akira Toriyama tech that I adore. It looks really cool. Like it really does. So I I hope it is uh, one of those weird random Bandai games. They just sometimes show up out of nowhere with these anime manga games that are just way better than they have any right to be. Like I think of One Piece which deserved a really good game, but they just showed up with One Piece Odyssey and it was like a phenomenal turn-based RPG. And it was it was like much higher quality than any other One Piece game we got in a while. Uh, but then they they dropped something like uh, Jujutsu Kaisen Curse Clash, which is one of the worst games I have ever played. Literally. One of the worst the games I've ever so played. I know, yeah. I know this cut yeah, deep. I, I know this cut deep. Yeah. You got the shirt remember. <laughs> <laughs> it is an awful video game. But then they show up with Sandland. I'm like, by the way, I'm not complaining because I love Akira Toriyama, but I'm like, how do you give more like there's clearly levels to the talent, right? Because like, how is Sandland looking better than one of the most popular anime on the planet? That's so big that in Japan, they literally make cafes based off of JJK. Like, how does that happen? So Bro. Uh, Sandland looks fantastic. I will be checking it out at launch. I'm not going to be checking out the demo, though. I'm already kind of sold on the game. Cog, will, will you be looking into it at all? Probably not my thing, but, you know, I definitely respect the art style, which I got a chance to look at. One thing he was really good at is vehicles. Like, yeah, I love I love the tech that he draws. Like, it's yeah. it, it it that's a weird dynamic to have because you have these very emotive, expressive characters that look cool, that are bright eyed, and powerful and energy. Mm-hmm. But then you could do this really mechanical, dope technological thing, and the robots and and the motorcycles. And I love that balance to his art style. But yeah, salute to them on the, on this. And it looked cool. I already know everyone part of that. <laughs> you know, the the, the the clan and the tribe will be a part of it. Um, sorry about your you know your JGK thing. I, I heard actually you'd be okay. very proud of me. Addict gave me a good anime lesson on <laughs> JJK, and something went down, and he was like, "Yo, the community's pissed off about this Gojo situation," and I'm like, "Word, he's breaking it down," <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh, I'm learning today." So I was like, "Why is it so? Oh, it's some off screen thing. They yeah. shouldn't have disrespected him like that." I ain't gonna spoil it for those who ain't watch, but I was just very intrigued. <laughs> how JJK intense community this is uh, is interesting. I'm not really in any anime community. I just hear about yeah. them in passing. JJK community to my reminds me of how the Game of Thrones community was when that show was airing live. Like, oh, we're just gonna fucking spoil this. Like, we're just oh, you didn't see it? Too bad. Oh, you didn't read? Too bad. We're just gonna spoil it. Like, catch up. Like, that's their vibe. And that's how everyone was with Game of Thrones. They're like, all right, new episode. This happened. This person died. Like, I'm just like, okay, thanks, guys. Appreciate thanks. it. Thanks. <laughs> JJK, JJK community is crazy. Yeah, salute to y'all. But uh, the, the, the Sand Land Joy, I already know it should do well. Mm-hmm. Agreed. All right, Cog, we're going to pause the news for a little bit. Let's talk about what games we are playing. As always, you are up first, sir. So sadly, very boring. Um, Sadly, (laughs) you know, a lot of travel and time has been limited and and a lot of things going on. So it's been the same, too. A bit of (laughs) a broken record. I apologize. It will change. It will change. But it's yeah, it's the same, too. Um, So obviously, uh, we talked about a lot about Bungie earlier. Um, Critical time, obviously, the um, Into the Light expansion so they just did a live stream um actually today and talking mm-hmm. about what they're going to do so it looks like this the mode's called onslaught and it's like defending the last city and what it is is obviously the the final shape is the witness which is the main you know enemy going through the portal going to do what he's going to do with the traveler but then you have the remaining forces that he has 
converging to try to pin the way they explain it to pin guardians down because we don't we have an emissary we're trying to send through there. We got through the other side mm-hmm. that's going to try to help us break this portal to get in there and stop him from doing what he got to do. But in the meantime, his forces are keeping us in there. So what this basically is, Maddie, just to simplify it, it's a glorified horde mode. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 basic. You set up your base, you set up. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a sucker for Gears of War. Horde. I remember when Cliffy B, we had him on, in, on ILP. One of his greatest things I felt was when he debuted Horde Mode in Gears of War. I love, I actually love Horde Mode more than I love multiplayer in Gears. Mm. So it's like setting up your tourists, setting up your mines, your traps, you know, their conversion on the city. And then you get this uh, monetary thing called Scrap. And Scrap allows you to invest as a three player team. Okay, you're going to put up the barbed wire stuff here. We're going to have these dummy um, sweeper bots here. We're going to have the defenses here, other other robot defenses and stuff like that. And it's run by Shaq. So it looks pretty cool. And it's like different. It's like waves as you go more on waves, you get more sure. better, more, more bosses, and then more loot, of course. So there's like a casual version of it and there's an arcade version. Now, I will admit, is it mind blowing? Is it, oh my God, this is you have bet no, this is hard, bro, y'all. Mm-hmm. Like, but I think for for coming up with this content in about two months, I thought it was pretty impressive. The stream could have been shorter. It, it didn't need to be an hour to show the same thing so long. It could have been 30 minutes. But it's interesting that they got three two more streams planned. So, you know, I'm gonna follow it. I've been playing a ton of Destiny again as I'm prepping for into the light, which I believe is um, a couple weeks, and then um, what you call it, the final shape, which will be in June. So mm-hmm. a lot of destiny, a lot of rocking with the homies on that, and then obviously that game, defining Tekken podcast, <laughs> <laughs> you know that we do here. Um, I want to shout out to the community because yo, bro, round with the Dukes, round with the Lords. Let me tell y'all, y'all hitting up the DMs crazy like yo, car. We listening to defining Duke. I hear about these player match tournaments. What's up? Of course, I got you. Now, the only thing is, I got to ask you who your main is, mm-hmm. right? Because I don't want a lot of duplicates. I don't want a lot of guys with, a name with the same character. Because the way I feel we get better as a ranked community and fighting each other is facing different characters we've never seen before. So you're like, oh, man, I never met. Now, here's the fun story. You see, I got the martial law story. So I was in the dojo secretly all week on a bar gala. <laughs> I'm like, yo, Law is nice. He hits so Law, hard. Bro, Law looking at Raven like, bro, Cog like me better. He's a martial mm. artist. <laughs> he got the Bruce Lee thing. He's a Bruce Lee fan. Bro, I, I practiced for a few days, got nice, and I'm like, I'm ready to debut him. Ready to bust him out. Nothing better so, in the loading screen hits. Oh, who's this? So get this, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know the vibe. Yeah. You know. You just stay, you stay quiet. And then as soon as the get ready for the next battle, they be like, oh, what's that? You, oh, you yeah. take it. Okay. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And you just debuted. That was the plan. I had it ready to go. Martial law. So days before I get, yo, first of all, shout out to Dagan. Shout out to Colin. Because they man, PJ, they, I met him at the wedding. Mm-hmm. And he told me, he's like, oh, I know you talk about that tech. I'm a tech guy. So, He's in the mix. He's like, yo. So I, I hit up the crew like, yo, we're going to do this. This is the date. This is the time. This is designated. It's like Fight Club. Mm-hmm. This is a designated place. It's designated time. You, you let us know if you can show up. I'm going to have a couple of private uh, spots available for guys to come in. You got and a I got my section crew. in your ranking. Yeah. Community. This is great. <laughs> so I reserve a couple of VIP spots for the community. And then I got my five, my six guys that we always run, for, you know, once or twice a week just to stay sharp. Mm-hmm. So. PJ hit me up, yo, car, I got y'all bringing Kuma through. Okay, cool. So we got PC, he's on PC, boom. Then I got PlayStation dudes hitting me. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to um my man Jake Lugo. He be always writing in. He be writing in to define a dude. He came, he's like, bro, I'm coming through. All right, cool. Who you running? Oh, I run Kazuya, cool. Come through. So we got it. So then somebody hit me up on Twitter, and he you could tell he's playing ranked all day. Mm-hmm. And he got martial law. Ooh. And I'm like, oh no. Because I remember what my plan was, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been practiced with Harang or Lee, no excuses. And I'm like, I'm ready. So I, I see his law as a one of the red ranks. I'm like, uh, so I was like, so that's your main? So he's like, I was like, damn, bro, I was about to debut law. Like, <laughs> I can't debut law. You, you an expert law? Because that yeah. was always my dream to fight against an expert Bruce Lee guy. But since nobody was taking him, I'm like, all right, I'll just take him. But I'm like, all right. So he's like, no, no, Kyle, you can take, I take Claudio on the side. Uh, so I'm like, yeah. 
so this was so the match start. We all get in the room. We are messing around. So Doc, who takes law, put out his law. This man proceeded to run through everybody. Oh boy! So we like, hey, yo, it, his law was so ill. I was like, I'm not bringing my law out today. <laughs> I was like, I'm there are some bringing- laws that break dance, dude. I, I there was one ass beating throughout my like 80 hours of gameplay. I faced a law online, and it was like I may have had like 20 hours in the game at that time, so I was still like learning a lot. But I, I'm still pretty confident I would not have had a chance against this guy even now with all I've learned. Like this dude harassed me, Bro. bullied me, destroyed me. <sighs> Any type of violent word you could attach to it. Like I was violated. Like this dude destroyed me. He ruined my Tekken career almost. Like he kicked my ass that bad. Like he was, it was just one of those fights where like I wasn't even butt mashing. You know, when like you get hit enough times, you're like, I'm not even touching a face button. Like we're all defense right now. He was still connecting on me. Like these walls just break dance when they're good. And then I hit him once for a knockdown. I step up. He just kip ups. Kicks me in the face. Great kick up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I get up, I got to work oh, on my get up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Every move, every answer. He was a perfect law player. Yeah. Perfect. Sure. Like, this guy was built different. Sorry. Go no. on. Though. I just have nah, to highlight. Like, if you run into a martial law, I, I like, I get a little nervous when I see the loaded screen hit and I see law. I'm just like, no, man, not this He's guy. He's a beast. Yeah. Yeah, man. He had a very good law. It was just beautiful to watch. And I was like, all right. So he's giving the crew trouble. A lot of the crew trouble. He's giving the new but be trouble. Then we, oh, shout out to my man. Oh, prolific. An amazing Ling Zayu player. Mm. Ooh, beautiful poetry, getting into our stances, back turn, all the feeling. Oh, it was beautiful. Shout out to my man Lugo. Nice Kazuya. So we had good comp. So then finally, my my dude Kaibatsu, which is Sovereign's younger brother, he's mm. a savage. So then it got to the point where you could tell, all right, enough. I'm, I'm tired of losing this game. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, enough. And then at the, uh, it was a bad night in the office for me, but I will give myself some credit. From the second half of the session on, I was like, all right, it's not working. I'm not taking a look. I tried to bring Lee out, which was rusty. I didn't practice. He was getting thrashed. I was like, oh, no. Then Lee is way better than how I was playing. I was like, oh, no. Yeah. I brought her ring out. I said, okay, I got to get it together. Bro, I saw I came on. People were like, yo, you was too hardy. So you did your thing. But I know what I'm capable of. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, y'all like that. I had my match. I had my wins. But like y'all supposed to get just supposed to get more work. <laughs> so I was supposed to give y'all way more work than what I gave y'all. So I, I, I've made I've been in a dojo. You know, shout out to the Rock Ally, shout out to the Series S. You know, I've tightened up. I downloaded y'all ghosts. I know what y'all was doing, mm. and I got the counters now. <laughs> oh, you know what I'm saying? So oh, bro, I so yo, you know what is real? Last point I'll say. This is what I I, I really smiled at Tekken Eight. <laughs> Kaibatsu and a couple other people who were giving me problems that night. Actually, shout out to Doc. He was one of them. <laughs> Certain character matches, I download that specific ghost. You know they're a problem when you download the ghost and the AI mimics them so well that the ghost is still beating you. I mm-hmm. said, no, no, this can't happen. The, no, we going to fix these problems. I got to yeah. figure out what I'm doing. Wrong. And I figured it out. I was like, oh, I'm an idiot. Okay. <laughs> Force correction. You know what I'm saying? Kind of thing. So at yeah. least it's going to be competitive on certain things than how certain things were going. But now nah, salute to everybody. The tech community is fantastic. And last thing I'll say, there's something really special about seeing all the platforms, PlayStation, PC, and my Xbox guys, we're all in the room. We can all spectate. It's just dope, man. And, and the Renaissance continues. So I know y'all tired of the realm of the Duke. So maybe tired of the tech and talk, but this is where it's at. Ranked is where it's at. And I'm, I'm very high. I've been playing a lot of ranked too, and I'm really doing my thing. I'm close to, I think, whatever the red level is or whatever. Because nice. they got all the different names. But yeah, I've been putting it in, man. So salute to, to A. It's, been, it's still been fun. It's still pumping in the brains nice. right now. Got to write in for the game I wanted to Ooh. start talking about here. Let's get it. Daniel J. Right. It's greetings, Duke Definers. Have either of you had the misfortune of playing the Star Wars Battlefront Classic Collection? I tried playing with some friends at launch and the game was buggy, crashed twice, had no servers available, which was later revealed they only had three up for the game. It somehow played worse than the original PC slash PS2 version, not to mention the absence of any kind of in-game party system to play with friends. Truly a shit show. We ended up playing just Fortnite with Star Wars skins. Quick shout out to you guys for how you handled the Sweet Baby Inc. topic last week. I appreciated your level of takes on the matter, especially COGS. I think Sweet Baby Inc. is a bad company, but many will find an excuse to shit on diversity in games with no nuance to the conversation. Keep up the great works, gents. I appreciate all you do. Thank you, Daniel J., for your write-in Much and your love, compliments J. to our conversation. A lot of people, I mean, that was 
tough topic to tackle. Probably. But a lot of people were very, very yeah. happy with our conversation there. So that was yeah. that was good to see. Because I that thought we did weird. well, but you never know until it's out. You of never the know, right? Yeah. And I thought, for the most part, people really loved our conversation. Yeah. I, I really, I thought we, I thought we did good, man. Yeah, absolutely. So, Daniel, I did have the misfortune of of playing the Battlefront Classic Collection. It was one of those games that um, I made a joke in my video about. It. I said, you know, I, said, I thought I was safe. Like I, you know, I, I there was the game coming out on on uh, March fourteenth. I was going to be away at that time. I was like, I'll play it when I get back. Maybe I'll make a video out of it. Who knows? I made a retro rebound talking about Battlefront one and two through backwards compatibility on Xbox and just how much I love these games. And so I was like, all right, you know, I don't know if I'll make a video on these, but like, you know, it's fine. It's a safe release, right? So it's, especially with Aspire handling the port work for it, like, mm-hmm. sure, the you know, botch would happen with the Kotor remake, apparently. Now, that's a report, mm-hmm. but they have always been known for their ports being done well. You know, they they brought Kotor to the Switch. They brought republic commando forward i got the platinum mm-hmm. trophy for that like you know they did jedi knight jedi academy and jedi knight 2 jedi outcast like okay good history here there's nothing yeah. to fear easy slam dunk mm-hmm. nope oh, oh man. man wow i i i was like so i i'm seeing online like the internet's lighting up like at first i saw multiplayer issues i'm like okay that's pretty bad but maybe it's because of an influx of players Dude, I catch up and like Daniel wrote here, they had three servers at launch. They said there was a bug preventing them from showing more servers. I do believe that because as time went on, more servers did appear. Like when I first started playing the game on Monday when I got back, uh, or no, sorry, Sunday when I got back, it was like, okay, there's there's more than three servers here. (laughs) That's good. Um, And I was able to get into a game. The ping in Battlefront 1 is disgustingly bad. The cutscenes after missions in Battlefront 2's campaign, gone. The the UI is fucked up. Mm. The uh I'm trying to think of what else that they messed up. They changed the loading screen sound effect in Battlefront 1, which is like I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's iconic and they changed it for some reason. Mm. And it sounds terrible. Mm. Uh the trophy achievement list is shared between the games, and it's mostly Battlefront 2. Battlefront 1 has like no trophies or achievements at all. It's a shared list of like 40 something trophy slash achievements. I hate that. I hate it. I hate, I hate that. especially that. that. Like they, you almost have to, in my opinion, try to fuck it up as bad as they did. Like it has to be an active effort. This to me doesn't just happen. This is a collective sequence of decisions made where it just had to be deliberate is how I've come to believe it. Cause I'm just like, there's no way with all of your port work, which has been decent, you just did Tomb Raider, which I know apparently another developer handled most of that. But even before that, you've done great port work in the past. How in God's name did you take Battlefront 1 and 2, which is probably set to be your highest grossing product of done right? How in God's name did you take these two and make them worse in every conceivable way? How did you figure that one out? It's impressive. It really is. And so as someone who grew up with Battlefront, like many of our listeners, still picked it up just to check it out. Um, you know, it, it's still an absolutely fun video game. Like these two games, I think, have aged really well. Um, I do have to call out the coverage of the game because oh. as someone who's done two retrospectives on Battlefront and as someone who's watched people talk about these games through rose tinted glasses i think some of the coverage of battlefront classic collection has been unbalanced by Mm. that i mean i was watching some videos not gonna name who i was watching videos Mm -hmm. a lot of people were like yeah man the ai is buggy and it's true but i think a lot of people forget how buggy battlefront 2 especially was and i'm not saying that didn't get worse but i have clips from when i was playing it on my xbox just last week Battlefront 2 is a it was made in a year's time. It's super buggy. Like there's AI just standing in the corner doing nothing all the time. It's a it's something you just look past all the time. But so many people are attached to their memories of their games. And they have they clearly haven't played these games in so long. I'm not even saying it's an elitist behavior, but they no, that's true. clearly haven't played the game in a while because they're like, yeah, it's it's buggy. Like these characters aren't running around and fighting. I'm like, e- what? Like, did you how did you forget <laughs> this? It's like a not in a, in a good way, but this is a part of the original product. Like this is what you got with battlefront. We just looked past it because the rest of the product was so good and forward thinking. Uh, there were people releasing reviews without testing the multiplayer 
and changing titles and thumbnails and all that shit. And I'm like sitting there going, you got caught with your pants down, dude. You did. Yeah. And, and that's, I get it because this is what, what I, I called it in my video. I was like, this is the type of review YouTubers will see and go like, oh, this is a, this is, what did I say the term was? I said, it's a, it's a, does it work review? That's what I called it. Mm. And I mean, you fire it up like, oh, it's Battlefront. You know, we know Battlefront. It's known quantity. Like it's very well mm. known among gamers. It's just, does it work? And right. how does it work? And reminisce. And I don't, I don't think there's a problem with that because like for Retro Rebound, like I didn't fully complete Mega Man Battle Network one through six for my review. Like I played each of them for five, six hours a piece as someone who would experience the games a lot. I think that's enough time to feel it out. But it's very clear that I think a lot of YouTubers about from one and two played like an hour or two. Like, yep, it's how I remembered. And that was it. And they put out their reviews of, by the way, just the single player portions, which were missing key features. Like all you had to, all I had to do was hear the Battlefront one sound effects. And I went, oh, something's wrong here. Like they mm. changed the sound of this game, which is already like Star Wars is is largely defined by sound. Like that's already a red flag. And the fact that he, that wasn't even caught. Um, I found the strange. coverage of this game disingenuous and disappointing. Uh, and I just have to say that because I'm not perfect. I've had my phone in reviews in the past. I had one for Galactic Civilizations 3 when I was, it was 2014. It was an early access review. You can find it on Mr. Maddie's channel. Rightfully, I got shit on for that review. It was fucking awful. I was phoning in on a review. I've done That's it before. True. I learned early in my career, but I've done it before. I get That's it. True. I just found it disappointing that there were people who were experienced, who had done this for a while, and they were clearly phoning it in, trying to cash in on easy views for a yeah. collection that was so obviously borked. You didn't even need online access. That just made it worse. That was like the amplifier. But yeah. the single player was busted. It was, wow. it was completely busted, minus the quality of life features that Daniel J had pointed out here. Uh, that just wasn't looked at with a critical eye at all. And it was really, really disappointing to see. Um, so yeah, I, I come in after the weekend and I'm like, let's check this thing out. And like, I was, I was feeling pretty sour with how it was covered be, beyond even how, how the game had uh, released the state it released in. Um, so yeah, Battlefront Classic Collection is, uh, it's also, by the way, like a 60, it's a 50 plus gigabyte game. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's big. That's big. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. Like these are like, when you go to download on Steam, actually here, we'll have, we'll have a fun little experiment here. Kyle. Hold on. Let me open up my Steam account here. I'm really curious if I were to install. Battle you want to see what that is, right that file size is. Yeah, because you know, it's funny you say that because I have seen some discrepancies on uh, file size. 2.8 gigabytes. Mm. Battlefront 1 and 9.59 gigabytes for Battlefront 2. Mm. This should be probably no bigger than, I'd say, 20 gigabytes. It's clear they didn't like I, someone suggested this in, in, in my comment section. I think it's right. Like they didn't optimize the textures or, or something like mm -hmm. that. Like they were just something was uncompressed. I don't know. They they it, it's clearly slapped together, though, and it's disappointing because uh, especially the trophy list, the trophy achievement list. Yeah, I didn't like it's such read. a bummer. It's dude. Yeah. The fact that th there are trophies and achievements on this list that are OK, for example, like you have Galactic Conquest, right? That's a that is the premier mode for Battlefront, in my opinion. Like that was the defining mode that made everyone love that series beyond like the gameplay and who you play as and how you approach it. Like that galactic conquest was that mode. And I think there's a reason why dice never dared to do it because it's, it's not impossible to replicate, but I think there's just a magic to it that you have to get just right. And if you don't do it right, you're going to get destroyed for it. Mm -hmm. So galactic conquest um, is this, is this premier mode in, in battlefront and there aren't any trophies or achievements attached to it. Really? Uh, they, instead they attach it to like, Get the energy regen medal. You know how you do that? You get like four kills as a as a stormtrooper. It's like achievements attached to that to like kill streaks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, you could have made either a mammoth achievement trophy list with those in tow, which would have been great, or attach them to modes and completion. But they like the fact that Battlefront One was just largely ignored. Yeah, that that's crazy. I like they, that. it's just it's yeah. just a complete miss because. Again, I've got the platinum for some of these these games that they've done, uh, Aspire. And I think Republic Commando's platinum was fantastic. Like they can do a good trophy list. This and it's funny because on the PlayStation blog, when they were hyping it up, dude, they fucking were we were boasting. They're like, we actually included some great achievements if we do say so ourselves. Like taking down the ATAT -AT with a with a with a Starfighter wrapping around it. I'm like, okay, cool. Like gameplay oriented right. tasks. Nice. And then I look at that's like one of them. <laughs> it's the only one of them. 
It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I hate stuff like that because especially when you love something and you you always want the attention to detail and the passion of especially a series of games, you know what I'm saying? You know, given to each one to, to, to properly respect mm-hmm. it, you know, especially if the mode there's modes in a game that don't have any reward for doing it. Like I can't stand that. Like it so, really bothers yeah. me and, and don't just put obscure achievements in just for the sake of it. So yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm funny. You mentioned that. Cause I have the same pet peeve. Yeah. It's so I annoying hate that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, come on y'all. Don't, don't do that like that. Yeah. Have, have a reverence for this franchise, at least have the people who do have that helping out with the yeah. cheap. Of this. I, um, I experienced multiple crashes when I was playing too. So it was, a, it was a mm. really disappointing time, unfortunately. Yeah, and sucks. I'm still going to go for the platinum just because I know these games front to back and I just want to get it. And I know it's not going to take a ton of time, but uh, super disappointing just to see how they handled everything, man. Uh, I've been mm-hmm. playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth some more. Mm-hmm. I really mm-hmm. hadn't been putting more than like a couple of hours in, so like I've been putting some meaty sessions in. I'm, yeah. um, I'm, I'm in the end game now. I'll okay, see, so you're close. I'm yeah. dying to know. Yeah, because you're like how you. It's so it funny. Conclude. Yeah, it's so funny. I mean, I'm still loving the game. It's so funny though, because there's two things I'm feeling at this game. Number one, it is definitely one of my favorite games of the year. But number two, I'm definitely. It's. I'm not going to sound like a broken record and go all into it again, but I can feel I'm not as enthused about the triple a open world direction and that even if it's something i absolutely adore like final fantasy 7 you got to do something different i'm like why was i enthusiastic about elden ring why am i enthusiastic about what dragon's dogma 2 hopes to offer and i'm like because it's different i don't think i'm tired of open world because i even felt a little fatigue with bethesda game studios i'm like you guys need to change shit up and like that's why i was thinking why did i enjoy the spaceship sections of starfield more than being on foot i'm like it was different i don't mean everything different is good because Bethesda, for example, and their DNA and how they create their games are fantastic. It's like a known quantity that I love. But I think with open world, especially, we've got to start reinventing things here mm. dramatically. Because if I mm. can't get fully into it with rebirth, we're gonna I'm gonna run into a problem in a couple months, a year's time. Like it's it's I'm on a, a on a clock right now. But nonetheless, mm. I still find myself doing the open world shit. <laughs> Yeah, the I, OCD, I, baby. I, I said I was funny. I was on Discord with my friends last night. Like, what are you playing? I'm playing Rebirth. It's like, where are you at? I tell them where I'm at. I said, yeah, I'm beelining this story. Actually, I think I've made my decision. I want to have this done by Dragon's Dogma. I'm gonna go for it. Yeah, there, there I am in the Nibelheim region, just <laughs> roaming around, getting proto relics, roaming around, and knocking off towers and doing combat mm-hmm. trials and do oh, I'll do all the life springs. Oh, a hidden boss appeared. Oh, I'll go do that. Three hours go by. I'm like, fuck me. I didn't play the story. Didn't move it. <laughs> I was like, I had so much fun, but I was like, okay. So I'm like, what is my conundrum with this game? I was like, I think it's just the content that lures me and isn't appealing. But when I'm playing it, I'm like, damn, this is not fun. So it's a fun game for sure. Absolutely loving it. But, um, it's definitely been an illuminating game to play, but yeah, uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth will be done this week. Uh, there's taking your time and there's whatever the hell I've been doing with it. So yeah, I, I, I should have had this done a while ago, but seeing Dragon's Dogma 2 is a little fire under my ass where I'm like, I need, and I also lost some time when I was on vacation. I didn't want to travel with my PS5, so I was like, I need yeah. to put some hours into this. I, I actually have to add one game to my list here. I forgot ooh, to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, we're going to add this here in real time because, of course, I've been playing Tekken 8, but we, we talked about that cog already. So yeah, my last game I'll talk about is is Outer Wilds. Really? What brought this on? So <laughs> I, I'm getting ready to travel. As I mentioned on last week's Defining Duke, I'm getting ready to travel. I'd like to have a little little travel companion with me. Like, what game am I going to play on the plane, right? Like, what's going to bring me a degree of safety while I'm on the plane? So I'm looking at my games. I lay out like a bunch on the floor. It's like 1 a.m. the night before I'm traveling. It's like the last thing I'm packing. I'm just laying out all on the floor. I do the same thing with games. Yeah. I, that's the last thing I'm packing. I want to make sure I got the right game. Oh, I yeah. do the same thing. It's so, it's so funny you say that because I'm, I'm like laying out on the floor, snap a picture, set it to group chat. I'm like, guys, like, all right. I said, I got a trip this weekend. We're going to be playing probably at nighttime whenever the fiance falls asleep. And we're going to be going to Boston next week. So like, I got some time to throw into something. Not a ton of time, but I'm going to be able to log some 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 decent hours here. So I lay out like Live Alive. I'm like, I could go for a replay of that. I lay out Final Fantasy 7 or 1 through set, uh, 6 Pixel Remaster. I'm like, these games are 20-ish hours, you know, kind of short. I'm like, 
maybe I could go through one of the older Final Fantasy games. I I lay out uh, Azure Striker Gunvolt 1 and 2 collection. I'm like, well, you know, little... This is from uh, Emmy Creates, the team that brought us like the Mega Man Zero games. Mega Man games are notoriously pretty quick, and I know that Azure Striker Gunvolt is not really a long game. I'm like, okay. I laid out a couple others. I think KOTOR was one of them. I was like, I could go with some KOTOR. Ooh. So I snap a picture, send it to them all, and they're like, probably Azure Striker Gunvolt. Me being the genius I am, I'm like, I'm not doing any of that. So I end up on the store. I'm sitting there in this couch next to me, just like scroll through the store, even though I got Ooh. all these options in front of me. And I found the Outer Wilds. Mm. And I look at it like, you know, because I've, I've spoken to Skill up a number of times. And he always, one thing we talk about is like, he struggles with reviewing games that he really, really adores. And he sometimes opts not to do it because he doesn't know how to put into words. He said, what are those is Outer Wilds? So that's already a pretty big vote of like, hey, this is an amazing game. I look it up like reviews because I'd never paid attention to Outer Wilds when it came out. I just always joked about it being the game that there was Outer Wilds and Outer Worlds. And I was an Outer Worlds guy. Um, I look and all these reviews are like, this is one of the best games. Like, this is an experience. This is incredible. Okay. Uh, that's kind of all I need to hear. I don't want to miss out on something like that. So it was like, it was with the DLC, uh, think close to 30 bucks. I'm like, Mm -hmm. it's a pretty, pretty big price tag for something that I don't know if I'm going to go all the way out on, but all right, let's go. So I buy it. I also, as a safety purchase, pick up the Mega Man Zero collection for 10 bucks. Yeah, just in case. Wreck. Just in case. <laughs> and I log in my Live Alive cartridge in case both those fail me. Because the other thing I was thinking about is like, if I'm having balance issues and I'm playing action games, I need like oh, a steady. I'm steady. Yes. So that's what I was thinking, right? So I'm thinking of health is wealth at the same time. So I got the whole game plan. I get on the plane. I start up Outer Wilds. And I know it's about. And by the way, I'm playing this on Switch. So I know it's not like a great looking game on Switch. For those who don't know, it's like this open world discovery game. You just you're dropped into this mystery. There seems to be a time I, like it's funny because I barely know shit about this game and I've played it for like 10 hours now. <laughs> but I, you fly. It's it's open world. So you you can take off a kind of like No Man's Sky. You can take off from a planet at any time you want. But what I'll say before I go any further is Realm of the Dukes. Help me. Help me understand this game. Help me get it. Help me love this game because I am struggling. Ooh. I am struggling so hard to understand the outer wilds like i am really struggling and i'm like i'm blaming i'm in the self-blame phase and i need someone to tell me it's okay it's i was in the same boat i need someone to tell me this is what you do Mm. i am so fucking lost with this game and it controls like shit so i looked it up on reddit i'm like all right i'm not the only one because what will happen is like it's very i guess physics based like when i'm in my ship and i'm flying towards a planet i'm like okay i want to land on here and you just keep going and going you're gaining momentum and you're flying and i'm like okay time to stop and i hit the brakes oh you're still going it's gonna keep carrying you and i just crash land and i die i'm like okay <laughs> lesson learned and there's just a lot of incidental deaths that i can get over but because there's this time loop mechanic i'll be investigating something finding clues i'm like okay i'm getting into this and i start to feel my controller vibrating I hear this sound start to pick up and I'm going on the plane. I'm actively going, no, 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 dude. Because like the dude next to me probably thought it was a psycho because I'm like, because <laughs> what happens is it doesn't matter what you're in the middle of doing. They just end the time loop and send you back to where you start. You got to go through it all again. So I'm in the middle of like a million puzzles. I'm going through these try. I think it's like the arcane tower trials or whatever it's called. I'm going through them or quantum trials. That's what it was. I'm, I'm figuring out these puzzles I'm like, okay cool you know i'm, I'm making pro- i'm doing a thing right now this is great and then i and then it resets the time loop and i gotta do all the fucking puzzles again i'm like wow i'm texting i'm texting lock inventing to him i'm like dude i don't fucking get this game i'm like this is such a bad experience right now like i don't like the outer <laughs> wilds and he's like no like i love this game great at because i texted him the first thing i said was like hey have you played the outer wilds he's like oh love it he's like the atmosphere is great he's like this is such a great game i'm like dude I was like, someone help me understand it. So I'm hoping the Realm of the Dukes can save me because I want yeah, to do a video on Retro Rebound for it by the end of the month. I've, I, when you're exploring this world, what you're going to be doing is like this, this race was once here called the Nomai and, and they are doing something. You're trying to figure that out. They're not here anymore though. And they've left behind a bunch of clues. And the only new tool you get is this thing called like a translator. You can hold it up to like text you find and it'll give you context clues. And it's literally a game about finding a million context clues and you go to your ship log 
and you'll see basically a conspiracy conspiracy series uh, theory board show up connecting all the dots like mm-hmm. okay we have uh the ash twin project and connecting to it is like this water cave that's found on the deep and like you so it's like all these things are connected i'm like okay i'm, I'm putting things together here i kind of don't together. get what the hell is happening but Something. like i i don't want to say too much because i don't know what would constitute as a spoiler or not but right, right. it's a time loop game and that's cool and it's a space game that's my favorite type of game i love sci-fi uh i love how there's a layer of mystery here i love discovering things but there's no sense of direction which is the game's biggest strength but can also be its biggest weakness because i just sometimes i'm like dude if, if i would look like the dude who did the cuphead demo sometimes if my gameplay got out there like i'm looking oh, like a man. fool playing outer wilds i'm just like what i'm just looking around he's like what am i doing here I'm just, <laughs> i'll run this route again maybe i'll find something i'm like i like am i dumb like so, so, mm. realm of the dukes validate me or scold me whatever yeah, it may be i i yeah. need to know we need this i like because i don't want to watch too much of reviews because i every review i watch is this game is special and I can't spoil a thing because it's that sacred of an experience. And therefore, I'm not going to say anything at all. And if you haven't played the game, just go play it. Otherwise, I'm going to spoil it for you. Every review I clicked on was that. I was like, so I don't know what is so what great it about is, it. Yeah. So I just need, I don't mean to freak out, but I need someone to help your boy out. Walk me through this realm of the Dukes because I'm losing my mind here. <sighs> I want to make a retro rebound video on this and I want to sing this game's praises, but it's making it very difficult. And I'm trying not to be Internet's public enemy number one for the Outer Wilds. I want to get it. There are things about it I do like, but it's really being overcome by the things I don't like about the game. So Outer Wilds, 10 hours on Switch. Mm. it's cozy i like some of the music that when you do discover something it is an amazing feeling but it's so it feels so few and far between of me finding something meaningful i'm just Mm. always finding little nuggets little like building blocks but nothing of pure consequence nothing yeah and it's more of a puzzle game than i expected which is fine i can get down with that uh but the puzzle is like the narrative and just i don't know if there's a there has yet to be a moment where something happens i'm just gathering information i'm like what like, when do we hit a point? Like, does a cutscene activate at some point when I get enough inter- nice. information? Because the time loop just begins randomly. I'm like, okay. Hmm. Then nothing has happened really of significant since then. So, again, Realm of the Dukes, write in comments, tweet me. Need your help. Please help me. <laughs> Please we help me, Obi Wan. You're my only hope. <laughs> All right. That's what we've been playing this week. No, no. Warm up question. We'll get into the news after. Diago Padreo writes in, Greetings, Iron Fist Addicts. The PS5 Pro info is leaked. As predicted, the upgrade will only feature the raw power of the GPU, teraflops, while RAM in general and CPU clocks will match pretty much the Series X. Did Xbox get a W by not launching a mid-gen and perhaps mid-gen refresh and perhaps prepare to launch new hardware earlier than previous generations? I personally would prefer new gen over a not significantly improvement of a current gen as always enjoy your day and keep the health in check thank you diago all right cog you're Yo. more of the techie than me so mm-hmm. i trust your read on this far more than i trust my own uh, mm-hmm. i have as a fan i agree with diago like i would prefer the more meaningful upgrade that would bring me different games different experiences that's more important mm-hmm. to me uh but for you who, who yeah. values power the newest piece of tech i think you have more of a valid answer on this than yeah. i would do you think Xbox wins here, if you will, by not having the mid-gen refresh or in a time where I know there's not questions really anymore about is the console going to be around for Xbox, but their hardware commitments are, are something that you, you wonder about long term in the future. Like you would have X execs like we talked about last week with Peter Moore saying like, yeah, Xbox is probably looking at like how they can get out of the console business because we were doing that during the 360 era. And so you see things like that picking up steam. And you wonder about, like, will Xbox do these things that are previously expected if it's a means to an end? So do you think Xbox is missing out by not doing a mid-gen refresh beyond what we'll talk about in our news next, which is this potential digital-only Series X? Yeah, I mean, it's shot to Diago Patron. Super cool dude. Um, I don't want to go as far as say it's a W like cut and dry yet because obviously there's still hardware coming it is going to be more powerful for the ps5 but what we've learned is that for the ps5 pro it seems to go in in the same footsteps of the ps4 pro which is the cpu upgrade is very it's the same cpu but just like an overclock Mm. and when i hear that as a person who 
you know, loves high frame rates. I remember as a Destiny fan, I'll tie it in, when the Xbox One X came out, right? And at the time, before the Xbox One X, Destiny was 30 frames per second on consoles. So I'm like, okay, Scorpio, Xbox One X, let's go. I know we're getting 60 frames now. Mm. And it came out and it was like, yeah, 4K, 30. You know what I'm <laughs> and I'm like, okay, but I didn't really care about the 4K, the HDR as much as the frame rate in this case. And, you know, again, I'm not saying that it's going to be exactly like that with the PS5 Pro generation. But what we are learning is that a lot of these companies, Maddie, they use the teraflop as a marketing tool to fool the casual consumer. So when you see 33 to, oh my God, that's going to be triple the power. Yeah. You know, it doesn't work like that. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's what we learned. And shout out to Digital Foundry. We had a great breakdown. I highly advise, if you don't want to believe me, <laughs> but I highly advise watching Digital Foundry's latest video in reference to the, because now these leaks are out. Like, Everyone's like, yep, this is confirmed. We got Tom Henderson out there confirming. We got Richard Ledbetter. Like, this is what it seems that we're getting. And again, what I'm more impressed with is the, what they call like their super sampling, you know, proprietary thing that they're going to do to try to get more resolution. And they may be able to pull off some things. But in relation to Xbox, here's the thing. I said at the time, even though I'm a power guy and I'm a tech guy, that even I wanted them to refresh at first. There was a part of me that says the situation has changed. Mm -hmm. Last time when the Xbox One X came out, Microsoft really didn't have the games. They didn't have the studios. Yeah. They were just able to promote the third party. Yo, Red, you know, Red Dead Redemption 2 runs better here, right? And that's fine. But ultimately what it came down to is when the Spider-Man and the God of Wars and the, came out, they were exclusive and they were performed. They look fantastic, right? So that's what Xbox has to do. They've got 10 games coming out. Yeah, we love the lineup that we're seeing, right? And my thing is that's going to help you the most. The power stuff has proven as much as, you know, for, in terms of Xbox's case, it really didn't move the needle. Now, PlayStation, they may get some, but I'm just of the firm belief that it's more of an enthusiast kind of machine. And, you know, unless I will give it a caveat, unless they can somehow tie it to Red Dead, I mean, excuse me, to Grand Theft Auto and say, yo, we've got the marketing. Here's PS5 Pro. Oh, by the way, you know, we actually can hit 60 frames, something like they can pull it off. If they could pull that off, that would be a huge thing because that's going to move consoles. That's a game that when it drops, it, it'll move consoles. So that's where I'm at. I think I going to be all right. <laughs> like in a weird session. Now, granted, when the third party comes and Digital Foundry does the third party comparison games, yeah, PS5 Pro going to have an advantage. We know that. So long as that doesn't get too ugly, <laughs> they, they will be fine. Just create the games that you got. You got the Hellblade, you got the Avowed, you got the Fables, you got you got all these games, the Indiana Jones, you got all these games lined up, the Blades, the blah, blah, blah. If you knock out the games and they're good, they will be fine. I completely agree. Um, I think if you're Xbox and you're looking at your roadmap for the coming years, and if you're a business and you're looking at like what money you're going to make, we already know consoles are made at a loss. And if you're Xbox and you're falling more and more in line with Microsoft's ideals, you're a software company. And what you'd be more interested in is having a box that can host your games and then bringing those games again, not to beat a dead horse here, but bringing those games to other platforms. So you kind of win if a PS5 Pro exists because I, again, I have this feeling that there will be a day Starfield is best run on PS5 Pro, you know, and that's, that's going to be a tough pill to swallow, but Xbox is going to love that because guess what that means is people who played Starfield on like a console uh, and want a better experience are going to go there and buy it again. People who waited and didn't buy it on Xbox are going to get the premium treatment and be like, oh, now I can play it. With They just dropped an update with over 500 fixes. Like they've been fixing, fixing, fixing the game. Like you're going to get the best version on PlayStation. That's going to be a better sales pitch for people. Like we waited and look what we got. The DLC will be out by that time, no doubt. Uh, so Xbox kind of wins by their competitors also having strong. I shouldn't say wins because that's very console worry and it sounds copy, but like Xbox can clearly benefit from their competitors having stronger hardware and more pieces of hardware. And all they want to do is again, create something that can be 
and their ecosystem host it that they can host on their own ecosystem. So like, okay, you have the disc based series X, but you're trending digital only, whether people like it or not, or recognize it or not. So you make it digital only series X, right? right? Like you just create SKUs and options for all types of consumers. That's why I think the dongle will come out sooner than expected. Uh, I I do believe the rumor that they'll do, they'll they'll jump ahead of the generation a little bit, kickstart something sooner rather than later. Uh, I think that allows them to control the messaging for a little bit. Uh, I think they're going to go more on that line of things. And and I again, I agree with Diago that I've never purchased a mid-gen refresh. The only one that I had, funny enough, was gifted to me by Xbox. It was the, the Gears of War Series S that we've talked about. Ooh, nice, uh, nice. That is the only mid-gen refresh kind of console I've had. Otherwise, every console I buy at the start of generation is what I have until the end of the generation. Like, I don't buy upgrades. I don't. I never have. I probably never will. I uh, The PS5, I was contemplating it with like the slim version because i don't like how the ps5 looks and there's the smaller right. version of that sounds great uh maybe i'll look in it i always try to keep it on my keep it in mind like i'll, I'll, I'll yeah. look into the ps5 pro if it's really a big difference and if it is smaller and it does appeal to what i need and and makes games better but uh you know i'm lucky enough where i have a pc where if i really care about frame rate or running things at the best quality possible like i do have that option but i prefer comfort and as long as i have a console and a couch I'm good. So yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, well said. I just wanted to add on to what you said in reference to the reason why, for me, the better play is the potential 2026 full generational upgrade. Right, yeah. the next gen console for them because that allows more time. And I know we're going to talk about it later about rumors and stuff, but you know, I I'd rather them have a gen to themselves as opposed to always launching side by a brand which is always been kind of synonymous with video games right. and you not. So you need to Peter more that thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That, that's how I am. So yeah, I, I do think to, to kind of flip the script, flip the memo, but you've got to do something drastic. Like you've done the drastic business update. And I think, you know, I, I mean, part of it, I'm attached to the idea because I do like it. So I have to acknowledge that. Yeah, me too. Like, I really do like the idea of them doing a 360 move again. Right. And just me being too. like, all right, let's go ahead. Like, let's just mm-hmm. let's leap in front of the line here. Uh, but I do think to call that attention to your brand, you have to be the only one in the room. Yes. You have to be like, we you know Switch Pro or 2 or whatever it's called is coming out next year. And if PlayStation is to follow the same rules as they always have, and they're doing a mid-gen refresh at the end of this year, according to Insider Gaming, that means they're likely hanging around until 27, 28, at the end of the generation. And if you guys could do something by 26, you could be the only one standing there. Uh, not that PlayStation doesn't have tech and development that they could accelerate or right. tech and development that uh, they could use as a mid-gen refresh to take away from the Xbox. I don't think they would just stand pat. I'm not going to be foolish enough to think that. But if Xbox is looking to call major attention to their brand and games and development, kind of coincide with all of that and controlling a zeitgeist, I do think you need to literally isolate yourself and welcome the attention on you instead of shying away from it because you're afraid you're going to have like another Xbox One level reveal screw up. Right. Like you have to go in if you're trying to bring your brand to the next level to to do something bold. Uh, so right. I, I am mean, keen on the idea. I hope they do it. And I think uh, more and more their reservations have suggested that's what they'll do. I know there have been other rumors that have suggested they're not going to do that. But I just think it would be with where they're trending, the smartest thing for them to do. Agreed. 100% agreed. And, and, and again, the Series X generation has, to me, proved it because they have done everything they can to be consumer friendly, price friendly, and still they're in the situation they're in when it head to head and point. PlayStation still, you see what I'm saying? Sell as many consoles. You've got to change up the formula. You have to do something drastic. Yeah. Because they were in stride at first. They were pretty mm-hmm. neck and neck, but then they lost the games and they lost the narrative and and uh, got beat out cleanly again. Yeah. And, uh, it just shows that as long as they have consistent content, maybe they can stay in that race. But I think momentum is everything. Like, I think even though Xbox One was putting out some really good exclusives, like I know they were few and far between. But when you look at like the start to the end of that generation, like there was really good stuff all throughout from like Ori to Sunset Overdrive to Forza Horizon, you know, and like how big that was for them. Gears of War mm-hmm. getting reignited once more. I mean, there was killer instinct i thought their there one spots. was phenomenal there, there, there was spots there were spots yeah i'm saying that spots, I, I, feel I like, get too crazy when I talk yeah <laughs> i know i'm not trying to hype it up but because i yeah. don't get me wrong i abandoned that generation completely yeah. after titanfall hit Bro, I, I was the pc at the while i was like yeah i can't yeah I'm after titanfall now. hit and i played that a ton that's when i moved on but they had the content and i feel like if they have that steady rollout 
uh, that can benefit them most because right when they stopped yeah. that is when they started to lose uh, their their place in the race. And I know it's not always about the race, but it's certainly a competition for them. And I imagine they would not be upset if they beat PlayStation for once. Uh, yeah. And I think the way you do that is you can control the narrative when you isolate yourself. So we'll see what they do. But I agree uh, with Cog and Diogo that I really don't feel like they need to participate in the mid-gen refresh, especially if they're looking to do something in a couple of years that's much more significant. Yeah, agreed. Number one on the news, a new Xbox development kit has been certified in South Korea. Filed under model number 2089, this kit was manufactured in China and Vietnam, but most interestingly, the point was made by VGC. According to their research, the Xbox Series X development kit filed under model number 1881 was certified by this same agency five months ahead of the console's November 2020 launch. So something worth taking away here, Cog, is that this could suggest something is inbound. As mm. Sarah Bond spoke to Xbox's hardware commitment during their business update, and we've seen all the leaks of an all-digital Series X code named Brooklyn that was said to be aiming for a late 2024 release. So this tells us two things, Cog, right? That number one, it seems like Brooklyn, the leak was, we knew the leak was legit, but that Brooklyn is still happening, although Phil claimed plans change. Uh, that Brooklyn seems to be still happening. But also, I don't think Xbox just launches new console SKUs for nothing, right? Like, I look at the Slim Series S they did with, or I'm not sorry, not the Slim, the Series S with two terabytes of memory. And mm-hmm. that was a one big tera. Thing. The one tera, I believe. Yeah. Was it one terabyte? I thought it was one tera. I can't You're remember. probably right. You're probably yeah. right. I apologize. I, the I, black I, joint. I'm not, yeah. I'm not a true little man supporter. <laughs> 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 they did the new Series S, though, alongside the launch of Starfield, and I think that helped them propel some additional console sales with a cheaper alternative there. Do you think this is to coincide with the launch of a certain big game like Indiana Jones, perhaps, at the tail end of the year? You know, We did hear about potential like December launch window for this game. Um, but what do you make of, of course, the news here, new development kit, uh, is the all digital series X inbound? Let me know your thoughts. Yeah, it feels like it. It feels like it. You know, we do know, you know, that the vibe has been consistent that they don't want to do a full on mid generation refresh, like how innovative of a PS5 Pro. But we do know based on the documentation that Brooklyn, uh, you know, the kind of spherical um, revision kind of uh, price cost cutting effective version of the console, as well as all digital, right, kind of fits in line. So usually with that, you get minimal upgrade grades, you know, maybe a 10 percent move here or maybe, you know, not, maybe, maybe, that, maybe that may be too much, but very minimal. You know what I'm saying? and boost and i think that it would fall in line with kind of how they did last last year remember when uh we watched the showcase and we we're like oh wow we didn't know about this you know black series s that's yeah. gonna have a terror like came yeah. it felt like it came out of nowhere so sometimes these sources are good indicators you know as far as sdk that something is coming you know we've also heard rumors of, of handhelds we don't we don't know you know maybe that's later you know kind of thing but th- certainly the vibe I get is this, you know, it will be consistent with what the current platform specifications are at this time, right? Whether it be in some form of a hybrid form or was it be form of an all digital form is, is what the real question is. And I think they'll try to link it to some type of cross promotion with whatever the big game, like you said, you made a good point. Indiana Jones could be one of those, you know, right. we got to see what's going on with a lot of the other first party lineup and other titles. Cause they seem very bullish on this year as far as all the stuff they want to show. So what they want to attach it to as far as from a release date standpoint in their calendar year is going to be critical to kind of pay attention and and watch. So seems on brand. I think that's, you know, what's going to happen. And yeah, um, I'm, it's most likely it's going to be something I'm most likely going to buy anyway. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, we'll see, we'll see. But what about you? What what are you thinking when you, you hear this kind of stuff and, you know, leaks and and, as far as this digital from a hallway standpoint? Yeah. Like I mentioned in our last topic, I, I'm not a big mid-gen refresh guy, so I'm trying to think of it from the standpoint of like, okay, it's not for me. I already own the system. I'm kind of rooted. I'm here. No need. I'm trying to think of like the new person stepping in and what this needs to do. And I feel like, okay, you have the power of the Series X, so sometimes there are compromises made to fit the games onto Series S. Uh, sometimes more compromises than there should be. Uh, but nonetheless, you have this Series X, all digital, uh, so you don't have to worry about your collection. So some people might like 
downsize their collection. So that's one way of approaching it, like sell off your physical games, upgrade, if you will, to a digital Series X. Uh, something about that for those who already own the system. Price proposition, I'm wondering about that. Holiday season drop, potentially. Uh, you're launching alongside. We have a plethora of games coming out for Xbox in the holiday season. So it could be anything from Indiana Jones to Avowed, even if that doesn't get delayed. Uh, so we'll see in due time. But I think the attachment to that is important as long alongside like, okay, we're potentially if your Xbox past the halfway point in the generation, if you're launching a new one in 2026, if you're doing a normal gen kind of thing, uh, then past halfway point. Have to interrupt one because I see some pertinent information to correct both both of us are saying. Okay, let's go. Um, shout out to DCCF Tech. Um, they basically said obviously the digital. Remember we talked about the the Brooklyn right mm-hmm. to a digital um Series X model was ruined to be worse. But it said the key point here is says it wouldn't need a new dev kit as its hardware would be identical to the current model and the next generation console is way too far from release to already have a dev kit certified. So they say just because, actually correcting what mm. we're saying, it says that just because it's a new skew, so to speak, it wouldn't need a new dev kit. So it mm. could be something else. And now that does kind of change my... Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, all right. Yeah. So... Professional podcasting once Professional more. Podcasting. Let's, let's, re, let's rewind. We nothing let's happened, rewind. right? Nothing happened. happened there. there. Ignore, ignore anything. <laughs> um, then I guess I've heard rumblings. I don't want to get too deep on this, but I did hear rumblings of a handheld. Mm. I did hear rumblings. This, of you mean, or are you saying like I've heard rumblings of? And again, I don't want to get into this. Oh, I have a source. I heard a rumor. And I don't want to get into all of that. But there was one thing that came across that was kind of like you know potential handheld. And it's not nothing new. People have been talking about Xbox handheld for long as Jazz been talking about. Like he thinks it's going to happen. So there's nothing new. Obviously, there ain't no breaking the information in. It's just that um, if it is a new dev kit, then that means yeah, it wouldn't be the Series X per se on that refresh. And if it's Maybe, maybe. It, it would definitely show their commitment to hardware. They're not going away. <laughs> now, let me ask you this, man. Let's play around with it. Let's just yeah, let's say, have let's okay. have fun. Let's just, let's just pie in the sky. Let's have some fun. What if we, we go to the direct and Maddie gets a beloved local Xbox Series X in the vein of a ROG ally with a, with a dedicated console UI and you ain't got to tweak and twerk with no PC or no <laughs> Windows, no tweaking and twerking. That's what King says when you're a PC game, you got to tweak and twerk. <laughs> he makes me laugh when he says that. You know what I'm so it's like, what, what would you say? You are the handheld guy. So what do we say? You will not find a more advent defender of xbox in those moments than right here on this show if they decide He's back, finally, boys. if they decide to finally do a handheld i would be so back it's not even funny man like i think they've just been the perfect fit for a while and i would love to see them try to do it especially because i'm a believer in their cloud gaming initiative i'm a believer in game pass and it's like okay like these are things that i think would work marvelously on your own handheld because we see what happens with other handhelds when you partner with them and they're built with your stuff in mind where it can go right i think the logitech g cloud with your cloud gaming initiative how right it can go i do think the asus rog ally was an example of when you don't have i'm um, like an operating system attached to it that kind of loads up your storefronts and everything works naturally like a steam deck the bumps in the roads that i can present because like my go-to PC handheld, if you will, is the Steam Deck OLED. Uh, and before that was the Steam Deck. I I cheated for a little bit, but then I realized, you know, that baby, it was just a one-time thing. Like, I, she means nothing to me. I, I want you. And so I was going back to the Steam Deck there. And um, yeah, so I, I think it's because this, the ROG Ally, for as impressive as it is, and as great as it is for those intermittent pickups, I just always struggle to launch games, updates. It's like there's always something ongoing with it that's annoying me. And I feel like if I had an Xbox handheld that had the power of the Steam Deck OLED even, um, and was able to play stuff locally, and it had the Xbox Cloud components built in mind with it, it just would go a long way with me, I think, where it's like none of this back-end stuff I got to do on my Steam Deck like I can play no, cloud gaming. Windows. I can go into a Game Pass app and there's the library. I can download it. It just, I don't even think I need to spell it out for the audience. It just sells itself. Like it's such 
an obvious friggin' thing to do. It can be a PS portal type of companion device. Like what I call that as a luxury companion device, or it could just be the, the thing that gets people into the Xbox ecosystem. Handhelds are all the rave. Xbox would be so stupid to not be going all over this right now, especially because you've dipped your toe in the pool. You've partnered with everybody. You've got a ton of girlfriends, Xbox. It's time to commit. <laughs> It's time to commit and bend the knee to the one you love, and that's handheld gaming. So, yeah, man, if we twist the story a little bit here and an Xbox handheld is inbound, I, I would be ecstatic, to, to say the least, because it's something I've wanted for a while. Cog, I want to know for you, though, with this information that, thank God, you brought up, you get an Xbox handheld announcement. Let's say June showcase. Seems like a good spot for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're doing this. and get Because here's the thing, right? And guess what? You can play Indiana Jones on this thing. You can play a mm. on this thing. Like they show the the big holiday lineup and they're like, you play all of this on here. Like, what is that doing for you? Your Lord handheld, if you will, right? Like you're yeah. rocking the ROG ally. You've had your oh. commitment issues to the PC gaming handheld scene. So what would an Xbox oh. handheld do for you to shake things up? What would they need to do rather for, for it to shake things up for you? This hits so home right now because let me tell you what's going on with me. We just talked about, Matt, you just laid out my life with your story about packing the last minute and doing the games and sending the pictures to the homies, yeah, right? Yeah. So here's the problem. We all know it's all Tekken all day, right? I get the ally on day one. Tekken 8 is running phenomenally. I'm doing 1080p, 120 hertz. Mm-hmm. Settings low, but I'm 60 frames. A little glitch in here and there, like little stutters here and there as far as like the character select screen. I don't care Yeah, I've that. heard it. Yeah. Yeah. When the game start, it was 60. Bro, so I'm getting, you know, this is what I usually do, right? Right before the tech in me says, right before the night of travel, boot up the games, make sure they're running right. Because I don't want to, the worst thing you could have is you got a long trip and you didn't download something. And then you get on that plane or the train and you're like, oh no, this is a brick. I can't do anything. Right? Yeah. So your boy throw out the tech in. Bro stuttering and flickering i'm like yo what happened mm-hmm. new update to tech in i'm like I'm, I'm i'm trying to research settings that my settings change nope settings the same looking through drivers uh, what's going on i'm hitting up forums so and my boy's like yo it may be a windows 11 patch update that broke the relationship <laughs> i'm like see this is that tweaking and twerking from pc game and i don't like <laughs> like when things should work, right? The worst thing you have, to, and this is why there will still always be a console gaming market because people just want to push it the button and it functions, right? Right? Yeah. right that's yeah. it. Give me and a button. Now I got to call fraud on myself because I didn't think they would Xbox would even consider doing a handheld. Mm. I'm like, nah, new skew, another development thing. Probably ain't going to do it. After reading that, you know, WCC Tech article, when we just pushed it out, and I'm like, wait a minute, that disqualifies Brooklyn from being a new SKU. So what the hell is it? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right? Because I'm like, what the? And I'm like, so I'm like, okay. And then that got me back to the head. And then here's the key. And I got to toot my own horn and give myself a little bit more credit now. Is... When I went, one of the biggest videos that we did for IOP that went viral is when I went to the Asus ROG mm-hmm. preview of it, That's right? Yeah. And I'll send you the link so you can see it right now for those who missed it, or for my boy who missed it, is that I thought it was interesting at the time, i just send it to you now, that look at the title of the video, right? It's, I was sitting there across from the Asus ROG ally. I had the VP of Asus gaming across for me. I had the senior VP of Microsoft Gaming. She's a chick on the left-hand side of the video. I am like, and and then you got that, one of the heads of AMD Gaming Mm. there and who's making the chipset, right? And the other two are just showcasing it. I'm like, why is AMD here? Why is Microsoft here? Mm. This is not your product. Now, granted, you're putting letting Game Pass go on a device, but you seem to have too keen an interest in handheld gaming. So I just thought it was very interesting. I'm, and, you know, I should spare leisure, listen to the interview where they think about this, how this is great, uh, such a great device. And even Phil himself has said, hey, they look at this as an extension. What if this is like we've been we've been taking notes all this time. We've been information gathering all this time. So when it's time to do ours, right, 
maybe this is it. So maybe, look, I'll be happy to be wrong on this one. Mm-hmm. I've always wanted an Xbox handheld. I want the the simple, clean UI of a console experience that's optimized. The specifications are to console, mm-hmm. and you boot it up to this device, and that's it. I got my friends list. I could do everything that because the wrong allies got everything minus that. Well, right? yeah, here, here's the other benefit, not to interrupt you, but here's the Please. other benefit of an Xbox handheld that mm-hmm. Steam benefited from, and that's a built-in library. Yes. Right? The Steam Deck for me was so appealing because I was like, out the gate, I got like 300 games just to try out. And some will work, some won't. For Xbox, like knowing, oh, if I got like tech and digital, yes. like that, that what, what was the term that Phil was using? I'm Oh, I I, I know because I've seen like the post. Mm-hmm. I was I was scouring the LSM Reddit, and they mm-hmm. couldn't think of the word laxative on sacred symbols. I know it drives <laughs> the audience nuts. When we can't think of a word that word, they know. I know it drives us crazy. But, but oh, dual entitlement. That's dual what it entitlement. Was. Yes. And Phil has yes. been saying that a little bit often lately, and mm-hmm. so I think that might play a factor if they were to do a handheld. You get that dual entitlement of like, hey, what you buy on your console, yes, is on your PC for your Xbox app. Might I add? And it's available on your handheld like that yes. sells the vision of what we talked about when the business update was ongoing of like you create a family of systems that are playable everywhere, whether it's apps, hardware. So you have these answers for like you have a controller. That's it. Smart TV app. You have a PlayStation. We're going to port our games there. You have a PC. Here's PC Game Pass. You can have Steam. You can access our games there. Uh, you you want to do handheld. Here's the x or whatever they're going to end up calling it like. These are the things that I think Xbox is doing that are wise and and how they're approaching things um, where they're trying to be everywhere. And I think a handheld is is part of that, which they benefit from so clearly. I mean, there's a market of double dippers who would just, you know, potentially look to buy stuff from one platform like OPS5 and then maybe I go over to handheld here and buy this again and start building my Xbox library up. Like you got to give people continuous reasons to invest in your platform and like being able to have mm-hmm. the pc console and handheld trifecta where you buy one game and it's just Bro. that that is the definition of ecosystem and like Facts. that is very tantalizing like that Bro. is a selling point that you could tell someone like well hey if you buy a console just know that eventually as you get into it more like you could buy the handheld later on and like you get that what you buy there on the digital storefront it gets more people buying games digitally which no doubt xbox wants because i'm not going to buy stuff physically on xbox if i know i can access it on the go on my on my whatever they call it the the exploit so i'm rambling now but uh yeah i, I cooking, i'm in cooking. love with the idea <laughs> i mean it's three other t points that as you got my mind thinking you know um three points for this to be successful you know okay. one will be the price point right getting now that the the, the the hardware is matured right getting it to an acceptable uh price point for the SKUs and, and it to be manufactured because right? you can't overprice it, get too crazy mm-hmm. and one advantage they have as a big manufacturer they should be able to get the chipsets for a cheaper price that's what helped rog ally get their prices down a little bit because people thought it was going to be way more expensive with the amount of the power of the z1 extreme chip that's in there so that's number one number two for me native game pass i, I don't want to yeah. hear no we already got the logitech g cloud yeah you know what i'm saying yeah. i don't want to hear you just come out and say hey guys stream Mm-hmm. Uh, no disrespect to the PlayStation Portal that uh, has no interest to me. Yeah, like as an owner I, of it, it's my least used handheld for sure. Yeah, I I, I need the ability if you allow me to download uh, a SD card or some hard drive to to put that in there, or you have some storage internal storage that I can at least have a couple of games going back and forth. That's going to be key. And now to to, to counter my other point, you, know, you still ha- have the cloud functionality as like, you know, your backup. We know your Azure. We know that you're going to use, you want to utilize cloud gaming. You could have the option to stream the game, yeah. but please let me have the name. That's where the ally is amazing. Just like our Game Pass, right? You have the option, download, play now. Yes. If they can pull that off and have a decent price point, which you could think they could still pull off at this stage of the console cycle, and let's say they get it in there on some, you know, maybe six, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, because it's still tech, y'all. I'm not going to sit there. This is not cheap. You're, you're miniaturizing these very powerful components. And um, if you can match the Series X's uh, thing, you know, that'd be great. If it's a Series S, I won't get too disrespectful, crazy, but I would I would love it to be a miniature C- Series X if possible. Okay. Uh, um. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm now, in. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. No, no, I'm finished. Please go. Xbox likes multiple SKUs now. Mm-hmm. 
do you think a way you cut costs is kind of what the Steam Deck did, where you had a very cheap budget option with like pretty low uh, file storage space? Oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you, they did mm-hmm. like a middle kind of tier option that was pretty good, yeah. and then they had the the. I think it was like the no glare screen, maximum storage space, the splash one. Splash giant. It comes with a carrying case. So do you think Xbox does that kind of your Series S, Series X, but for handhelds? Because to me, that's very, uh, that seems very much possible, right? Like, or yeah. a streaming only option. I mean, that sounds stupid, I guess, but yeah. I don't know. I'm just tossing ideas out there. Do you think they do a weaker and stronger option, if you will, to lower it, the price? It's very well possible because we we have precedent, right? We have this Steam Deck, with the different SKUs. Now, granted, um, the initial one, I believe, was just like more memory, I believe. Yeah. Was what it was with SKU. But we do have precedent with the ROG Ally. The ROG Ally dropped with the Z1 Extreme chip, right? RDNA 3 and all the bells and whistles. But then they dropped like a $100 cheaper one, mm. which was like, you know, the um, Z1 right without the Extreme, which was a little less. Now, that one came out later. They both did launch at the same time, but it came out later and it was a cheaper price point. It depends. It depends on the value proposition. If it's not worth it, then there's a part of me that says, hey, I will say there will be multiple SKUs in your defense. Even if it's if it's the same technological base, let's say it's a Series X base, right? As far as the technological power of the device. But you may have a cheaper version, you know, with the less storage, mm. right? Without the bells and whistles. Then you got like the Steam Deck where here's the, the screen and here's the, you know, the packaging and whatever. And more yeah. of a terabyte, you know, I could see that. I can see that, but see, I'm getting too, y'all get excited. <laughs> like, I really, I really want this, this to be true. Fanboy allegations, we <laughs> yeah. just can't be. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little fanboy. Love a little the bit. idea too much. <laughs> because there's a part of me that I, I erased it from my, my hopes and dreams, man. Like, I That's erased it. Yeah. It, like, it ain't happening. They, they already in this cloud. But if, you know, if the, if the propositions of cloud and stuff is changing in the building, if the dedication to hardware changes this, we did hear rumors of 2026 that this was a, a, a skew of the next generation could be like a switch version. Like that, those are rumors that were floating around. So if they want to get people into the mindset of handheld gaming early before 2026, mm. then you get them, a con- you get them conditioned to a, a version, a box now of the same skew, a, a portable of the same skew. And you can really yeah, say, Hey, this is a, also Xbox, right? Be a culture shock. If like next system for, for the outsiders looking right. at mind you, for us, who we were paying attention to these like rumors and trademarks and images and stuff like for us less so, but for like someone on the outside who just knows Xbox is a box, and then all of a sudden you see the switch hybrid. They're like, what the fuck? Yeah. So at least if you do something in maybe the end of this year and then you do a switch light rendition in the following year and then you have the new console in 2026, that is that hybrid. Now we're talking about a little more association with the handle. I think you're right. I think you're on the yeah. line. Yeah, and it doesn't send that culture shock. Like, hey, what are you doing? Oh, no, no, we did that. Remember they had the, the, the X-Boy yeah. Light, you know what I'm saying, in 2024 <laughs> that came out there. Remember that? You know what I'm saying? We was all playing. And then it's like, oh, yeah, it makes sense. They would make a more powerful version with the new system. Yeah. It could work. It's, it, I, I wouldn't get too hyped because I'm getting myself so excited. But, you know, I, I hope it is true. I hope it yeah. is true because I think that it's a, it's the natural progression from their, for their ethos, which is you could play wherever you want to play, right? Mm-hmm. You want to play we on PC? We all play. We all win. We all win. Yeah. Get, get the fill, get the tattoo, solidify your legacy. <laughs> <laughs> do the pick of more, get the tattoo. We all play, we all win. I'm yeah, telling Moore you. got two tattoos. Phil's got to do that for one of these he's days. Got he's, got, he's got to commit to a game. He should have done it for Starfield. That would have been hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> get the yeah. logo tattooed on his shoulder. Only thing of Peter Moore was, was strong on that day. He he knew his release day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Starfield, That's a little fair. shit you can't play yeah. with, but still like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we see what happens, man. Exciting news, but yeah, it, it, that changed the game with the yeah the de- the dev kit situation. Yeah, meaning that it wouldn't need a new uh, a Brooklyn Digital Revision Series X wouldn't need a new dev kit. Yeah, that changes my thought process for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Same here. Mm-hmm. So we'll leave all of that in so people can watch us in real time. Put yeah. our brains in our heads. <laughs> yeah, laugh at us. <laughs> Just enjoy our misery. Joy our pain. All right, Cog. Next up here, last bit of news. Coming soon to Xbox Game Pass. On March 20th, you get the quarry for console and cloud. March 21st, you get Evil West on console, PC, and cloud. March 26th, Terra Invicta comes to PC Game Pass. 
March 28th, Diablo 4 drops the first Activision Blizzard Game Pass drop console and PC. March 28th, you're also going to get Hot Wheels Unleashed 2 on console, PC, and cloud, and Open Roads on console, PC, and cloud. April 1st, you get Arc System, uh, or not sorry, System, sorry, Arc Survival Ascended on Xbox Series X and S, PC, and cloud. April 2nd, you're going to get both F123 on cloud and Super Hot Mind Control Delete on console, PC, and cloud. Kog, I have a selection here for you of one that I think you would really like. Have you looked into Terra Invicta at all? I have not. I'm going to look at that. This yeah, is from the cool. creators of a really popular XCOM mod. It's Whoa. called like Long War. Okay. Okay. And I don't know anything else about it, but they just recently grabbed it for PC Game Pass. And when I saw XCOM and I saw the mod makers, mm. it kind of excited me for you because yeah. I remember like I haven't played it yet, but Forgotten City was exciting for me because they made Forgotten City as a Skyrim mod first. And I was like, oh, and then they made it to a full game. So uh, mm. but I thought you might find this one interesting for sure yeah. because it's got that XCOM energy. Got that XCOM energy. Got that for my XCOM hardcore. It got that Geoscape energy. And I love Geoscapes, Ooh. the global visual of a thing. There's some planetary space type joy. All right. It looks Look, it look a little daunting though, man. I ain't gonna lie. Uh, yeah, I haven't looked into it much. I just saw the connection, but uh it looked pretty hardcore. Yeah, it look, it look like you playing like you about this life. Like it looks real. <laughs> Sometimes some some UIs are intimidating. This does have a little oh, bit of an intimidation. Yeah. <laughs> Bro, like it look like yo, you better be about this space life for a while. So we'll we'll see. Turn we'll rate, see. Heat sink capacity, yeah. length beam, crew, cruise acceleration, current mass, dry mass, wet mass, current mass. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh, they into the star field. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They they into that. So uh uh, yeah, we, we'll right. see. Yeah, yeah, this looks pretty intense. I wouldn't blame you if you were a little. We'll uh, see, but a little not into that. <laughs> I want to shout out. I actually, I mean, that's huge. Look, let's just be clear. Diablo Four coming, bro. Yeah, that shot in the arm. That's a shot in Game Pass. I want to see what that does. Also, want to see how they handle. Here's the question. Remember, um, the Diablo port is on um Blitz. Right, Blizzard, Blizzard.net. How does the Game Pass version go into the store? The integration, how does that work? Right, I want to see about that, especially for the PC community. How? Because let's be honest, the PC guys are going to play it most likely on Blizzard.net. But I just want to—I'm curious about the PC Game Pass version of this, if that is the case. And then I'll see the influx of players on Game Pass for a console. That'll be huge. And then close, they got a DLC coming. Evil West, y'all. Evil West, I covered that game. That people sleeping. That game. Oh yeah. Oh, that's a nice romp, visual looking game. Covered it at PAX Deep, like maybe a year, two years before. That's a nice shot in the arm for Game Pass. And I'm a I'm a I like this month. The quarry. That's the type of um what you call it games that I'll be liking. Them little narrative. Yeah. Like walking simulators. But those <laughs> you know say like those i the, the Detroit become human kind of vibe joint. Yeah where it's choice driven that that's what i remember i think this to be and i had my eye on it so yeah i'm right this is a busy month for just kind of kind of it's a good cool. month for game pass again yeah, yeah. how the story gonna unfold kind of thing so yeah i just want to shout out evil west above all of these games here i i think this game is <clears throat> so good I, uh, I when i dropped my review i literally called the peak fiction i said it's just such a fun world to be in the the control scheme for the game is excellent like it feels very good to play uh you get new weapons and tools like crazy but it's also built like an xbox 360 ps3 era game and in the best way possible it's not an insult to the game it's it's got its exploration it's got its moments where it opens up a bit but it's a lot of like combat galleries and just tearing up foes but it's this alternate history approach like it reminded me for those of you out there who are like me, you'll remember a game called Damnation. Hmm. And Damnation was a game, I remember when I was younger, I was so excited for this game, Cog. And when I saw the reviews, I was so heartbroken. Damnation <laughs> is this third-person shooter where you you play as um, like cowboys, but it's kind of steampunky. So it's a mixture of Wild hmm. West and steampunk. And I think Evil West literally looked at that game and said, all right, let's do that, but mix in Doom a little bit and do it better. So it's literally third-person Doom. Like, I'm talking, you'll pull dudes in and and just, like, Falcon punch them and, and unleash shotgun rounds. You're switching weapons constantly, lots of weaknesses to target. So, again, you're all over your controllers. You're fighting these enemies. It is kinetic. It is fun. The world is amazing. Like, 
you'll see characters throughout history, characters, people throughout history that you'll recognize and how they tie into the narrative. It's it's very Assassin's Creed in that way, mm. where it's like really cool what they do. It's just a yeah. It's it's a very imaginative world. It's very daring. It's very fun. It's 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 an amazing game. Don't sleep on this mm. one. I think it's also co op, by the way. So mm, keep that in yeah, mind. Blue Soul, yes. And man, now you got me thinking. Imagine how great that would be on the go too. I know. I I have played it on Steam Deck. It does work fine there. Um, mm-hmm. So that is a good option. But Xbox, I'm just saying, yeah. dual entitlement. Yeah, I mean, hey, I, I don't have it on Game Pass. I'd be able to play it on a X Boy version. <laughs> let me stop. Let me stop. Sure would what do be you nice. Think they call their handheld. Do you think what they call, call X Boy? Right, like, like they have to put X something. Something, right? Oh, what would they do though? It would be interesting how they would. It, it would be the Xbox something, right? X Boy. I, I feel they can't. Do they get clouded? You think they room? do the Xbox something, not X something? I go to I, my gut would say they'll stay with the Xbox prefix. Mm. But you never know. You never I know. Being something compl- corny like Xbox Go. That would sting. That would no sting. one know. I should be some, <laughs> some whack like that. Yeah. <laughs> hey guys, Xbox ready to move. ready to go? <laughs> <laughs> That's like that Nintendo energy. All their games are about like going outside taking breaks i'm like shut up guys like i'm fucking Bro. playing a game here stop it stop trying to check me <laughs> i laughed at the dudes at the basketball court cool. hold on bro Put yeah right now. yeah <laughs> like nintendo for a video comp video game company is obsessed with people going outside i'm like yes when i am interacting with your stuff i don't want to be outside <laughs> it's that simple fair enough fair enough uh, Hot Wheels Unleashed 2 is apparently really good. Uh, for those of you looking for a racing game fix, Diablo 4, like Cog called out, another great one here. Although I've, a lot of people hate this game. I, I just, any yeah, video I see myself, it. I don't know why. I just turned on it. Yeah, like a lot of people are, very, like it went from champion of, of the Diablo games to like Blizzard at it again. How did you screw this up? And I think it has everything to do with the one part of the game I didn't interface with, which is the end game. But uh, yeah, I, so that's on me. Yeah, that's what but, I. Uh, what I did play of the game throughout the whole story, I enjoyed a lot. I thought it was really fun to play. So wow. shout out Diablo Four, definitely worth a try at least on Game Pass. Uh, just don't buy the microtransactions. That's definitely one reason why people are not happy with Blizzard's efforts on Diablo Four. The microtransactions are pretty egregious. But otherwise. A great list of additions here. Super Hot uh, is a game I also really enjoyed. Very short. I don't know if Mind Control Delete adds anything, but Super mm-hmm. Hot was like only a couple hours long, and that was also a pretty good story. Oh, dude, yeah, I'm I'm fell crazy. What fell crazy? On most play, I don't even, I don't even see it. The Apple Four. Thirty. Oh, Destiny's at twelve. So that's I already know. I'm oh. like. Starfield's ahead of it. I'm like, where? I don't even <laughs> see Diablo on the list. Wow. And we're like, this is 50 games, 49 that explains games. explains the Game Pass edition. They're like, yo, <laughs> we're dropping off here. Boost that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah Diablo. Well, damn, I didn't realize Diablo felt like that. People playing Red Dead Redemption 2 right now, morning. <laughs> That's, cra- <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Round out the top 20. Mm-mm-mm. I mean, top 15, excuse me. Is that Red Dead, Red Dead Redemption 2? Grand Theft Auto Online, Dead by Daylight, Destiny, Rocket League. That, that's 15 through, I mean, that's uh, 12, 13, 14, I mean, 11 through 15. So, wow. Yeah, that's wow. where Diablo is right now. All right, Diablo. Well, it's time to step it up, hopefully, with Game mm-hmm. Pass in tow. You'll be able yep. to do and that. And the new content drop that's coming, uh, like, not that long after, Summer, I think. where they're going to have their Phantom Liberty style chain. Yep. People yeah. are really raving about the update that they're supposed to be doing. So, hopefully, that'll give them the boost as well. Fingers crossed. Yeah. All right, Cog. Time for our Game Pass pick of the week. You picked Control last week. It's my turn this week, and I picked a new Game Pass edition that I simply had to put some love on. SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. Uh, This is probably my favorite 3D platformer ever. And I know that's a little funny to say. I I am a huge SpongeBob fan. Still to this day, I watch tons of clips from SpongeBob. Uh, I just think the humor, especially in the original seasons, is impeccable. Like it is one of the best made TV shows, in my opinion. One of the best written for sure. But nonetheless, growing up as a kid, you know, you play a lot of SpongeBob games. You get Revenge of the Flying Dutchman, which was ass. You get Super Sponge, which was ass. Like you get these really bad SpongeBob games, and then 
here comes let me get the developer's name hold on i want to make sure i properly call them out battle uh, for purple lamp uh, this that was for the that was for the remake hold oh, on it was, remake. Iron, okay. it was iron something heavy iron studios there we go heavy iron studios rolls on in and says oh we've got the answer introducing spongebob squarepants battle for bikini bottom a 3d platformer you get to play as patrick get to play as sandy cheeks and you get to run around, you know, because this thing is as a kid, you see all these different episodes and all these different locations, and you just want to be there and just see what's going on. And Battle for Bikini Bottom is like this pseudo open world game that just lets you see every single facet of the SpongeBob world and do like mini games in them and collect golden spatulas and dirty socks. And it's an absolutely Super fun time. I love this game so much. Um, so many memories packed into it. Trophy and achievement list is also pretty good if anyone's interested in collecting for that. Uh, but for me, it's it's really about like very tight platforming. Uh, all of these characters have unique play styles, if you will. Uh, it's something I actually com- complimented in Cosmic Shake, which came out a little bit over a year ago now, I believe. Uh, Cosmic Shake was a spiritual successor to, to Battle for Bikini Bottom. Uh, from mm. Purple Lamp, who had been making uh, ah, the rehydrated right. game, so um, mm-hmm. they they kind of took what they learned there and built what I thought was a really great game. Like I I enjoyed it a ton. Um, per- Cosmic Shake is also good. So if you want a precursor to that and sort of see the building blocks to lead into why people were so high on Cosmic Shake, it's not a perfect game, but um, why it was so charming to people. Play Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. Immerse yourself in this SpongeBob 3D platformer. Get all those collectibles because like. That's the thing about the game is you'll go around, you'll complete these quests, you'll get golden spatulas, and like certain areas are are, are golden spatula gated. Like you'll need 15 to access the Krusty Krab, 30 to access the Chum Bucket. And some of them are side areas that you'll just go into and you'll find like quests and collectibles. Others progress the story. Uh, it's it's an absolutely marvelously fun time. Uh, I highly recommend that. If you're looking for a deep cut, go get SpongeBob SquarePants Truth or Square on 360. That is another spiritual successor to Battle for Bikini Bottom. It's mm. fantastic. Yeah. So uh, nice. that's my that's my weird level of knowledge on SpongeBob video games. But <laughs> played them all, you are the them connoisseur. All. You are the I connoisseur. Love, I love yeah, that, man. man. Yeah. So seriously, do not sleep on Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. Really worth your time. Dope pick. Restored content cut from the original game, like the Robo Squidward boss fight and more. <laughs> Freedom this. They, they sell it, bro. And it's a great Game Pass edition. So salute. So we might have to fly on the seat of our pants here, Cog, because mm-hmm. our final question is uh, is about handhelds. And I'm looking through it again. And for the la- I don't want to be redundant here, but we've kind of talked about what we want to see. It's, it's from Chase Shadows asking us what we want to see in an Xbox handheld. And when I constructed this episode, I picked this question because I was like, oh, we're not going to get into that. And then we got all into that. So I'm going to try to on the fly here dig into number of questions here and congrats to scott holdsworth we're going to use your question good day dukes this latest batch of game pass announcements continues the trend of both quality and quantity do you think microsoft has given the green light to xbox to spend more on third-party titles to get them into the service thank you for your beautiful smiles scott thank you that's very oh, very first, kind to you very yeah. kind very kind that's actually something that king says about my smile anytime i laugh I'm oh like, yeah, yeah you light up the room king, no yeah no one loves my smile more no, than yes. king bro king is a fan he's a fan of the smile <laughs> boy, bring the all right <laughs> so apologies to chase shadows please please write in uh next week we appreciate yes. your question on the last but we don't want the show to get too redundant here so in the active yeah. professional podcasting your scott holdsworth has the question we just went through our Game Pass pick of the week. We just went through uh, our Game Pass additions coming these next couple of weeks. We talked about last week how many games are coming in, and just it, was, it feels like that old school Game Pass that we knew and loved. Yes. Like, like oh, here comes the content. How am I going to play all this? Uh, what do you think of Scott's theory here? But also, what do you make of this trend of quality and quantity? Again, at first it was very much like, hey, we're in our day one bag. Like we're just going to do new stuff. Do they? potentially have seen like uh, it didn't really pan out that well let's just like dump a bunch of games in or is there no rhyme or reason to it it's just a hot season right now what do you make of xbox's recent shift to how they're dumping games in the game pass a little bit of both i think that um a lot of this is seasonal and contractual when things get finalized and then the timing just kind of probably works out works out for them to be able to put some stuff in but 
you know, there I am surprised at the fact that I thought as they acquired more studios, the third party bags would get less and less. And I'm not seeing that all the way yet. I think maybe their approach maybe is still to get popular older titles that were missed. Um, obviously, we're still going to get the day like we have to consider day at Diablo four now that ABK is acquired one of their own. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think we, we're going to see a nice mix. What What's surprising me more is the quantity. Mm-hmm. We're getting the quantity again, as opposed to like, you know, the quantity of quality. Like we, we, we're getting a lot of really good games all at one time. And that's how it used to be when it first started. Like, oh, my yeah. God, it's so much good stuff. I always stuff. remember getting the Mass Effect Legendary Edition, the Hitman oh. Trilogy in the same week. I was like, what are you guys doing? Dude, what are you doing to <laughs> us? You know what I'm saying? And that, that's high quality. So I think that's the cadence that they, they, they slowly back into i don't know if they can keep that up that that that's very hard to maintain but it's been really good lately so i think they're not spending a whole bunch on the big third party bags maybe they get some older stuff here and there they're being very selective i feel with the newer third party bags and when i look at i look at something like my beloved path of the goddess right i look at that as like the new wave of giving the new IP something that a, a studio may not be all the way sure if they're going to be a hit yet, right? Like the XO Primals, the we're not sure, but hey, we want to get like Outriders fell in that category at one point, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think that's what we'll see, and then you'll you, you'll back gate with stuff like this that maybe was like a a year old or something like that, and or missed out on the launch. Okay, here it is. You know, kind of thing. But what do you think? You think um they're going to be spending more? You think this is the cadence? Think this is a blip? Where where do you think this is? I I wonder if this could possibly be the power world effect. By that I mean, it's probably not the biggest bag they had to spend for Game Pass, right? And look how much that probably panned out for them. You know, tons of users came through Game Pass and Xbox as we saw with the stats this time, the actual numbers. So that was good to get that actual concrete information. Um, and I wonder if they're looking at that going, why are we spending so much on Wolong? And why are we spending so much maybe on like Atlas games even? Like, why are we spending so much on these when we could just continue to to invest in smaller things where we talked about Terra Invicta, like very hardcore PC game, but like maybe that's where the money's going instead. Like, let's go get smaller games, indie games. Like, let's mm. go after those. Let's get more experimental games because those seem to be where uh, the, the biggest chance of growth can be achieved and we can be a part of that. So I wonder if if that's part of it. Certainly, I can also attribute it to um, maybe just wanting to, like, I look at how much they probably had to spend on these games and as you're getting closer and closer to a plethora of first party games, you know, they say they have 10 games coming out this year, Xbox. They should have less third party day one games in the service because your own content pipeline should be providing that value now. Like you sh- you have Activision, you have Bethesda, you have your first party studios, you have these indie deals through ID at Xbox. Like you shouldn't really need to go, I say as in quotes, like beyond your borders to go and get more games coming out day one of the service. Like you are at the point where you should be providing enough most months where you maybe need to go outside the box a couple of times to get in uh, those, those extra games. So maybe this is why they're going more to that backlog focused game pass edition lineup, because it's like, we're about to have a ton of games. We're going to have a new Microsoft flight simulator. We're going to have Hellblade two avowed Indiana Jones. Uh, we're going to have our history untold. We're going to mm-hmm. have, uh, 33 immortals we're gonna we're mm-hmm. gonna have what's that game from uh towerborn like we're Towerborn, gonna have all these yeah. other games many Indiana we don't Jones. know maybe call of duty's in game pass day one mm-hmm. this year like they're adding so much in from their own parties that they would be silly to continue to spend beyond that because then they're probably going to bleed a ton more cash through game pass than they otherwise may have so that's how i'm kind of looking at it it might be just a financially sensible thing to do to start feeding it with things that are probably they cost money, but they're definitely cheaper deals to get something that's been out for like a year or two versus something that's coming out fresh day one. Uh, yeah. So, and the, in the Indies, their budgets are lower, so they can probably the price they're paying for some of these games that have been out for a while is maybe what they have to pay to get something day one on Indie. And then again, mm. you look at something like power world and the growth and the amount of money you can make off of that. So it's, I think it just kind of explains itself as you think about it yeah. more. 
No, I think you well said. Uh, I think that you're onto something there, and I think that um, yeah, it's it's more cost effective, and and you also from a developer standpoint, you get visibility for for one of your games that is now out of the zeitgeist, and it's that second bump mm. later, right? Yeah. And then Microsoft didn't have to pay as much as if they would have tried to went to you at the beginning of your launch. Yeah. I'm just thinking of like Evil West and stuff like that. What that would have cost to have that at launch when you could have it now, and you got like you said your first party supplementing the big stuff. So yeah, agreed. All right. Awesome. Well, with that cog, it's time for us to start wrapping up episode 168 of Defining Duke and Xbox podcast, because that's it. All of our questions, all of our topics, all of our news done. I forgot to say this at the top of the show. We're recording this uh, a night early. Early. Yes. Uh, yeah, we that's usually like priority one. But yeah, uh, this, this clearly has been an off episode. That's <laughs> 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 just so much professional podcasting at once here. Podcasting. But yeah, we are recording this a little bit in advance as Cog is traveling uh, to to PAX East earlier than I. I'm traveling on Friday uh, because it's going to be like a shorter PAX East for me this year. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, we're both going to hopefully meet up. We yeah, should get like food or something this year. Yeah, yeah for I sure. I feel like we just meet up on the show floor quickly. Yeah. But I feel like we should figure something out. Like we'll, we'll hash agree. it out afterwards. We'll hash it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, we got some. Take some good Man. pictures, have some good yeah. food together. That's some food, that's some grub, chill. Yeah. Yeah, I need that in my life. I need some cog in my life. Beyond you the know they go, You know they're going to get you. So they're going to clip us down. <laughs> <laughs> they got us. They already. They're like, yep, he needs more cog in his life. Got us. <laughs> 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 oh, well, with that cog, hashtag for the week. What are we I thinking mean, here? It's got to be some handheld focus. We've been, mm. we, we, we gushed. We, 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 we got crazy on that segment. This is supposed to I be a short show. A pocket one. Okay, what you got? Hands on DD. Hands on DD. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go all the way with it. <laughs> I love it. All right. Awesome. So, ladies and gentlemen, you got this deep into the episode. You want to let us know. Give us your thoughts. Give us your feedback. I am at G27Status on Twitter or X. Cog is at Lord Cognito. Tag both of us there using the hashtag hands on DD. Don't be afraid. You're not going to get judged. Just tell them the show is great. If anyone asks, they see it on your Twitter feed. Yeah, what's, what's tell my hands on Ds for? Just have them listen. <laughs> Have them listen and, and, you know, we grow. You get a friend who's interested in the thing you're interested in. Just share it with them, right? Uh, it. But nonetheless, use that hashtag hands on DD. Let us know your thoughts on the episode. If you don't use social media, we get it. Go ahead into the comments down below. Use the hashtag hands on DD. Let us know your thoughts. And with that, Cog, it's been another fantastic episode. Yes. I will see you later this week, sir. See you this week, sir. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we will see all of you next week for episode 169 of Defining Duke and Xbox Podcast. Until then, take okay care of yourselves, and we'll catch you next time. Peace out. Defining Duke and Xbox Podcast is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded from the United States of America. The show is conceived by Matthew Mr. Matty Play Schroeder and me, Colin Moriarty, and is written and produced by Matthew Schroeder. Maddie's co-host is Barry Lord Cognito Eversley. Defining Duke's executive producer is Dustin Furman, and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including Defining Duke, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level on Patreon, and we're thankful for your kindness and generosity. 